Hey. Hey out there. <laughs> How are you? I just hit my tooth on the windscreen. Yeah. Sorry. I, uh, I know you're weird about that. You've been, you, well, that's essentially your microphone. I mean, it's my microphone, but the orange one is yours. Doesn't this just like roll around on the floor when I'm not here? No. I it, it doesn't it collect. A, I mean, it, it looks like it collects dust and dog hair. And it's probably touched the floor before, like many, everything in my house. Do you sit on it? Ha, no. Why would I sit on it? It just, it, it just feels like it's been abused because every time you look at it, like... There's well, a lot of things on it that aren't orange, even though the yeah. foam screen is orange. Yeah, it's uh, <laughs> everything in this house collects dog hair. That's just the way that it is. Um, it's fine. I I don't want you to ever use this blue one because I get like, this is what I record vocals with sometimes, and I get like all up on it sometimes. You know this because you're a fellow vocalist. Yes. But when you use Allegedly. when you use mics, you can smell people's collected saliva on it. You, you know what's funny? Uh, I've I've never carried around my own microphone from show to show ever, not once. Exactly. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. So you you pick up a microphone and you're smelling all the history of the right. microphone, and it's kind of disgusting if you think about it. You know what's funny is um I I went all through my musical career i guess up until this point was screaming so when you're screaming you kind of like you grip the microphone the head of the microphone yeah and i remember when i uh went to karaoke for the first time i learned that you can't do that like when you're singing you got to kind of you know get some distance between you and that that old microphone um i remember coming off the stage from like the first time i ever sang karaoke and I was like, oh, was it good? They're like, yeah, it was really good, but you were so fucking loud. <laughs> I was like, oh, shit, sorry. Like, so from then on, I would go up on karaoke. I'd be like, can I get a little bit less? <laughs> and the guy would be like, are you fucking serious? I was sound checking at the karaoke bar. I, I don't blame you. I blame the sound guy. I know, right? Because you know my problem with sound guys, Jay. No, I don't. What's your problem with sound guy? You've heard me talk about this before. Shout it out used to, to dr- used to drive me nuts when I had when I was on stage. I had to explain to a sound guy. Yeah, this guitarist is not as loud. I'm talking when they sing. Right. For whatever, uh, like Eric's mic would just be so much lower than Josh's when they sing. Yeah. And a sound guy should be able to do figure that out on his own without me having to say, "Do you turn his mic up?" When it's so blatant, it's obvious that they are both singers. They're supposed to know that. You're talking about your monitor, right? Your on stage monitor. No, I'm talking about in general. Well, how would you be able to tell from the stage what the rest of the mix out there is sounding? Because every single Brave the Storm show had like a half dozen to a dozen of my friends group, and I would ask them. They were telling you. I would ask them, "Doesn't he need to go up?" Because you can hear it somewhat. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. Um, and I would say, hey, does he, or they would tell me he needs to go up. And then it's like, if my friend who knows nothing about music can pick that out, sound guys used to drive me nuts trying to figure all that out. The theory. Um, so that sound guy should have known oh, yeah, that you needed sure. to be turned that down. That guy, for sure. The, the theory of where you should stand for optimal sound quality in a concert is by the sound booth because it's supposed to be the best place Exactly. For people to hear. It's not always how it is. Sometimes it's just placed in a convenient spot. Um, play, actually, standing super close to the stage is not great sound quality. Because, oh, I know. Um, you get, you're not getting as much. You just can't collect it all. Well, you're, Yeah, you're not getting as much of the mix out here. You're probably picking up a little bit of the mix from the monitors if you're like super close to the stage. And you're picking up amps and all that reverberating sound. Uh, what, what did you ask for in your on stage monitors because everybody's different right everybody's different in what they prefer well to if, hear more if i can't hear myself i wear myself out more yeah you definitely gotta because hear yourself, yeah. if i naturally i push harder mm-hmm. and so as the show progresses my voice starts to die out right so i just need to be able to hear myself super well yeah and that's pretty much all i need um i don't I don't really need to hear anything else because, again, being in the position that you're in on the stage. I mean, what did you pay attention to to keep time? Just Ryan playing drums mainly. Yeah. 
I mean, I, it's not like I couldn't hear it to the point where I would lose myself. I know, right. I was never lost in what, with what was happening. You can hear it enough. It's not it's not the ideal mix, if you will. I'm not hearing the ideal what the audience should hear, right. but it's mu- something is might be somewhat muffled or whatever. But I, I'm still able to keep the time. Ryan played to a metronome, mm-hmm. so he was pretty much just on it the entire time. Right. Yeah, I always, uh, luckily for us, most of the shows that we played, Matt was always running sound, and he had yeah. really nice sound equipment. Sure. <clears throat> I, I would always, you know, most places didn't have a full-on, like, drum mics. They weren't miking up every single thing. But but he did. They well, He would, but some places just didn't need it, and he wouldn't do it because it, you wouldn't, it was... You wouldn't need it for, like, a, if it was, like, so, a, such a really place. super close, like yeah. a church show, you wouldn't so much need Yeah, that. you'd mic the kick drum, and I would ask for that because that, you know, that's sort of what everything's centering around is that that the like, timing of the kick drum right i would get a little i would get bass too because I, I wouldn't need as much guitar uh we talked before screaming in a band's a percussive sort of right approach to things you don't necessarily need as much melody if i was singing of course you would need some guitar and this and that when i became friends with matt like really yeah. good friends and josh started to sort of be his apprentice if you will right. and I, well, I was listening to a lot of their conversations and I didn't realize that there are some sound guys who purposefully make the older bands. I never considered it, or I'm sorry, not the older bands, the first bands playing in a show. They purposely make them sound worse, yeah, so that the headliner sounds the best. Right. I didn't realize that, so I didn't really pick up on it until much later in my career that that was happening. Right. But of course, not every sound guy knows that too. I don't think like someone like Matt Wilson. That's the kind of strategy he would have, or he would make that play. But like, if we're playing at some random church and it's just like their sound guy, I don't think he's doing that, right? Because I don't. He's there. He's he's not a sound guy. Sound guy. He does sound at a church. Yeah. There's also yeah. Um, there's no. There's nothing to be gained from making somebody exactly not sound as good. Yeah. But uh, our reunion show that we had. We were like the co-headliners. The the whole point of the show was that it was the Brave the Storm reunion. Right. And they made us sound like garbage because we were second to last. Who booked the show? Brandon Brenniger of okay. O the Blood. Okay. Fair enough. I was gonna say, makes sense now. <laughs> yeah. It was it was the most annoying thing. And not not only did it, we, it was just a terrible <laughs> Was mix. Matt there for it? I don't think so. So one of the things that would always happen with us is Matt was always around with us. For those, I mean, I'm not going to reiterate. Matt Wilson. Super much, yeah. He managed my band and a guy uh, that, friends with Jay. A guy that I kind of grew up with, and he's a tour manager now for really big bands. And anyway, he booked a lot of shows in our hometown. He would always at least be at our shows, even if he didn't book them. I remember, actually, it was our last show. We played in Berea. Uh, down, do what did he? The do what did he. And... I didn't give a shit about anything at that point. I was just there. To, I don't even know if I think it was like a last second thing. They were like, "Hey, do you want to play the show?" And I was like, "Not really, because it's too far." <laughs> so, but we <laughs> went anyways. Um, I think Gwen Stacy played too, and uh, Matt, shout out Patrick Meadows. Matt was there, and he was like, I- "I'm just gonna do sound for you," and I was like, "Okay." So he just like <laughs> went and took over the. Actually, it might have been his equipment. Now that I think about it, I don't know. I don't know for sure. Somebody can tell me. Have you ever watched Matt Wilson run sound? Well, yeah. Oh, like just, I listen. I it was so fascinating to watch him skip around the stage. I grew <laughs> up with this guy, and he's always been like that. Like he's always <laughs> like running around this is like imagine a, a it's a marty mcfly type of character this guy just this scrawny short little guy skipping around and he he has the attitude of a squirrel i mean he's just always moving and into something and always distracted and watching him run sound and like <laughs> run away from the board to like see if a, the band's playing Band's playing, the show's going on. He'll leave the board, run over, see if this this cord is hooked up, make sure that the symbol isn't falling, and he'll run back. And I'm watching him. I, I've I've been behind the soundboard when yeah. he's worked, and the band is playing, and I'm watching his soundboard, and 
from the minute that song starts, for three to four minutes, however long it takes, he is fiddling with knobs, changing levels, and he never stops to just watch the band. He's always got to be doing something. And as I'm watching it, in my ear, the band that I'm hearing, sound never changes. Well, yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> but, but he is constantly, quote unquote, doing things. Right. But I never had any idea what any of it meant because I couldn't hear the evidence of it. It always made me laugh. Right, yeah. Watching it's, him uh, do that. It's an art, man. I remember, just to speak to what you were saying, I remember there was one show that we were playing, uh, and in the middle of the song, I told him, somebody in my band was like hey i need a little bit more whatever it was and i like signaled to him looked at him and then went and did my thing for five seconds and i turned around and he was literally crawling on the stage <laughs> <laughs> underneath me i was like i literally just looked up and now you're on the fucking stage yeah. but he was like trying to <laughs> like he was trying to be spider-man as low to the ground as he could to not be a distraction but that's all he was and in fact everybody in my, in my band was like <laughs> it's fine but that's why he's it's the best good. man he absolutely. was the best in the business absolutely i miss that guy uh, i'll probably yeah. see him at a farmer's market soon that's he, usually what happens oh my god if for those of you who don't know so the, let's let's keep talking about matt wilson for a second so the last time <laughs> i think the last time i hung out with him was i know you've seen him since jurassic world jurassic world and so we were always trying to connect. I was doing film beef at the time. We were always trying to connect so that he could come on the podcast. And he, he would be a great podcast guest. Um, Absolutely. No, no matter what we were talking about. And he would talk just some mad shit about bands. And not hold <laughs> yeah. back. He's done that would it before. Be great. I've, I've heard it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. On yeah. other podcasts. I would yeah. love. I think some of our listeners would love to hear Absolutely. some of that too. Some of that too. Absolutely. Bands that they love, and he, Matt Wilson, could talk about knowing Those them personally. Those guys are dicks. Yeah, 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 yeah. That'd be great. Um, we need to, we need to try to catch them. We need to actively try to get that to happen a little bit because we're slacking on that too. We got to push harder, I think. But anyway, so <laughs> we, uh, we went to Jurassic World together, and we had, we went to a, a brewery beforehand, and we, we were all drinking, and I he forced me to ride with him over to the movie. And I was like, I wasn't confident where he was. I was like, ah, I don't really want to. And he like forced me to do it. It was all fine. But, um, on the way there, he was like, I have this brilliant idea. What if you just filmed yourself going to the movies? And that's like, yeah, a million YouTube channels do that. Put a GoPro in your car. Okay. Like comedians and cars getting coffee. Put a GoPro in your car. Talk about the movie and then review it when you leave. So he was all about this, and I was just, I was just like sitting there listening to him. He's like, yeah, 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 yeah. On the way to the theater, the movie is starting in one minute. Right. He decides to take a harsh left and not go to the theater, but he stops at Best Buy. Matt, what the hell are you doing? They're waiting on us to see Jurassic World. I'm gonna buy you a GoPro, Matt Wilson forced me to accept a GoPro right then right. and there so uh, that I could start this uh, film project. And we all know how that's going. So many videos on Sight and Tatter are filmed with a GoPro. <laughs> right. But uh, that's that's the kind of guy he is. And uh, But yeah, he um, hated Jurassic World. Same. And he has been ripping... Colin Trevorrow ever since. <laughs> so, uh, oh my God. He's a huge Star Wars fan. He's a huge Star Wars yeah. fan. So when it was announced that Trevorrow was directing episode nine, he was fucking pissed. Yeah. And like when we start our uh, Star Wars show to rival Jedi Council, he will be a he, weekly co host. He, it was like Christmas. It was like Christmas. He, he, since Jurassic World, he has sent me two texts. He sent me a text the day. Trevorrow was booted from episode nine. <laughs> Just a ha, 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 ha. Hadn't talked to him in forever. Uh, he thinks of me every time Trevorrow comes up. And then he texted me uh, last week when Trevorrow was announced to do Jurassic World 3. And uh, he was pissed all over again. And God, he's just a funny dude. Yeah. He's a, he, he's a bit of a movie buff in general. I mean, yeah. there was a lot of times like that was the common thing between us as we talk about movies a lot. I tried very hard 
he he has a similar background where he was like filming stuff in middle school with his yeah. friends like I did and we connected and he said he had always wanted to be in Hol- work in Hollywood and like write movies and stuff. So he was someone I tried, tried, keyword, to involve when I was making the movie back in the day. Excuse me. I wanted Matt Wilson to play the lead in yep. my movie, but you know how he is. He's so shady right. and flaky and all over the place. No, he's not shady. He's not like... He's shady. He's not shady. He he's, is shady. He's not shady. He's shifty. Like, he's like a he's like a worm. He can... You never know where he's going to be. He may say he's showing up to something and just not doing it. Like, he just won't show the, up. We will make plans to hang out. He never goes through with it. But yeah. when he asks me to hang out, He's asking for that precise moment. Yeah. I remember it was like 9 a.m. That's not shady, though. That shady would be like he's trying to cut it's a It's shady drug if deal he's constantly something. dodging plans. No. That, it's not? No. There's nothing sh- like shady. I'm, that's, I'm curious would by be that like behavior. He's that's running sure. a prostitution ring or something <laughs> like on the side while he's on tour. I mean, yeah. Or he's stealing money from people. Did you ever have an issue like... Did you ever get, maybe jealous isn't the word, but did you ever have a friend that, like, you all would make plans, maybe come out, maybe came over to watch a game or watch a UFC match or something like that, and then he's there 15 minutes and then gets a call from a girl, and then he just leaves? Don't you call that? But he doesn't really tell you, but he doesn't really tell you what he's doing. He's just like, oh, I got to go. And then you find out later it's because he went to go hang out with somebody else or something. Yeah, I've, I've had that happen before. That's shady behavior to me. Yeah, that's not shady to me. My, again, my definition of shady is like well, someone that you can't trust. But whatever. I mean, they're just words. Who cares what their definitions are, really? <laughs> um, everybody? <laughs> not me. I mean, that's, w- that's why a word exists to not me. sort of it's give meaning to something. Okay, very good. Uh, You're talking to the... Uh, language is arbitrary. These days, just, arbitrage. Just use emotion. It's all good. Emotion, emojis, whatever. It doesn't matter. Uh, it's uh, it's a. Uh, we're doing another late one. I think it's a little weird around here. When I, I feel shows. terrible. I feel terrible. Well, you're occupying every Saturday that I have. I know, and it's uh, something's got to change. Ryan Selling. Why's my hand here? Well, what are we gonna do? Here, to fix this? Here's what we've run into because my job just quit it. I, I'm really because Actually, of the, real talk, real talk, real quick. The hashtag transparency. I need you to realize and understand. I, I'm not a jealous person. I'm not an envious person. One thing that I wish I had that you have, you have <laughs> with with your with your job, you have an abundance of fantastic uh, experience to get legitimately any job in this field that you're in that you want. But for some reason, you are locked into this one. And that's what is strange to me. I'm not locked. Why don't you work at Starbucks? Because that's not... If you worked at this one, they close at 4 o'clock every day. (laughs) That's true. I would love it if you worked at the Starbucks in Versailles. That would be why. <gasps> oh no, I said where I live. That's fine. It's not a big deal. What? Yeah, it was never a big deal. Yeah. Why? Um, I don't know. Somebody just broke in to you, somewhere. You don't Close want to me. me to make your drink. I think you would be weird about that. No, I would. I would long for it, considering that you understand the struggle. Well, I I immediately counted out the Starbucks where I live because I found out Starbucks girl was married with a kid. That doesn't matter. You, your your problem she's, with working at she's, Starbucks she's in your cute. hometown is that you're going to see one too many people, yet you work at not Dollar at that General. One. No. <laughs> where? Not at that one. Okay. I wouldn't run into that many people that I know at that one. Okay. Because it's not in the, that's not the populated area of town. and I'm gotcha. not, I didn't grow up on that side of town, so. That doesn't bother me. I don't see how I could get... I don't know of any position that would be about parallel to where I'm at. That's what I'm saying. Like, mm-hmm. I feel like I've kind of have to start over a little bit. That is an option uh, when you factor in uh, some of the stuff that might be headed our way. Um, 
pa- Patreon and uh, just whatever right. whatever comes of the afterthoughts deal and things like that. So yeah, we'll get into that in a second. Yeah, I I don't know, man. It's it's weird right now. Is uh the the reason why we're at this funky place is because uh my truck day is on Friday, which means I have to work the weekends essentially. Right. I mean. I just have to work the weekends, and yeah. I'm at a stage where I'm only closing. So believe me, I tw- I tweeted about it yesterday. I was like, I I want to see all these fucking movies, but I can't go see any of them. I'm not going to get to see a quiet place until Wednesday. Yeah. Uh, no, I mean, I was I was giving you shit in terms of the schedule thing. It's not a big deal. I know it'll it'll all work out for the best. Uh, I did uh, get the. Schedule cleared up for a yeah. Legion and uh, Afterthought. Yeah, for sure. I said that like a bar, right? <laughs> <laughs> VCR, record. It's it's weird right now. Like, uh, I've I'll tell you what I do like about us recording late like this. So, one thing that gets kind of old is when we record every Saturday in the middle of the day because it's a, such a huge chunk of time just plopped right in the middle. And it's hard to do anything before, and then it's hard to do anything after. Um, so that that makes it difficult. It's been nice to have all of Saturday just to get things done for Sight and Sound. Or today I did some stuff for Sight and Sound. I did some cleaning. I did some music stuff. It was actually really, really, really nice. Uh, I've, I've got this deadline for More Than Music, Episode 3, staring at me in my face. And... Need to get it done. Need to get moving on it because we uh, we need to record. You some got what stuff. two weeks? Yeah, yeah. Uh, real quick before we get into talking about some some of this afterthoughts thing, collider afterthoughts. We I stumbled upon something this week on our date on our data, our statistics, our plays and whatnot. You were very uh, very big in pushing for Spotify to get Spotify to happen and we had to kind of work out some things to make sure that it was the right decision for us, the right move for us. Cause at one point we thought that we were going to have to change things, how we did things in order to make it work. We found out that not only is that not the case, we've never had to second guess anything going on Spotify. It almost makes you wonder if any of that is actually real at all. Right. I've I've noticed that if you I mean none of the episodes are missing. Yeah, the guideline that we're mainly referring to is that each podcast would have to be at two hundred megabytes. But when we do a two and a half hour show, it goes over that. Right. And so when I asked the tech, I was like, "Look, is this is is it a smart? Is it an intelligent?" read on the feed like is it just going to completely disregard anything that doesn't fit the guidelines and the person was like yes but it just hasn't so if you go back yeah my less jedi commentary has to be over 200 megabytes it's over it's two and a half hours but uh it's it's worked out yeah well the reason i'm bringing it up is because looking at some of our data and we don't i don't think we get it real time like we do with podbean it's a daylight it is a, it's just a day. If you looked it up it now, it, yesterday's reporting would be the... Interesting. Okay. Well, it just operates much different than the, what the rest of podcasts do. But what I will say about it is it's been incredibly nice and beneficial for the music stuff that we do in particular. Like any artist, their name that we put in the title of our episodes, if you were to go on Spotify and look up, for instance, Drake or... Bonnie Vare. I did my more than music on Bonnie Vare. If you look that person up in the search results, you will see our podcast. And it's just very nice for people to be able to find it like that. Saw similar, we see similar results with music stuff on iTunes, but obviously people aren't really going to iTunes as much for music stuff. So it's just been really nice. Um, it's, it's been a, a really cool avenue. And but your music episodes are killing it on YouTube. Yeah, they're do, they're doing really good, and they I think always do. that has to do a little bit lately with yeah with with titling and sort of how I've been doing. You gotta start putting the album names. Some portion portion of the show. Yeah, I mean, if you I, would put because I think you on the latest one you put like Cardi B album reaction. Yeah, but the the problem with that though is like I'm I'm not trying to get YouTube plays. Like I want them. That's cool, but that's not what my goal is, right? So the under oath 
album preview. Yeah, but it's not the only Under Oath Erase Me album preview was absolutely 100% had that goal in mind of let's right. attract some attention here. Um, but you look at something like the Ben Howard episode that I did where I just was speculating on something and mm-hmm. people still absolutely. gravitated towards it. So uh, it's nice. I don't know if people are sticking around from stuff like that, but it's just a very, it's also an odd time. And I guess we can transition into talking about some of this other stuff. It's an odd time because we just closed the the book on Counterpart, which is, which was nice. It was a great show. Uh, really, really enjoyed it. And we opened up Legion. And our partnership with TV Time was always going to be, especially now, was going to be a very interesting experience, sort of seeing how that was going to work, considering that we used to do the show on another feed. And it's going to be distributed on Sight and Sound. And it looks like it's paying off. It looks like it's working as of right now. The episodes are doing better than what they would typically do. Is that safe to say? On on our feed, yes. yes. They're doing less right. than what Let's Talk Legion did. but Yeah, of course. Um, so that's nice. That's a good thing. These are all little, I think, calculated milestones that we look at throughout the year of things that are happening that help sight and sound grow. The new thing that's taking place that is helping sight and sound grow doesn't really have anything to do with sight and sound outside of just Ryan and I doing things. Do you want to sort of explain to people who might not be in the know about what's going on? I think most, uh, I mean, a lot of our fan base comes over from Schmobile. So a lot of you already know this. Um, But then again, I don't know how many of those people listen to After Schmo. Like, just because they came to us because of Schmoville doesn't right. mean that it was always because of After Schmo. It right. could have just been sort of like, hey, I heard of this other guy. And okay. Uh, but a lot, so a lot of you already know this, but the show that Jay and I were doing, we've been doing it for the past year, After Schmo, um, is sort of, uh, it started out as a recap of the Schmo's No Show. And we would sort of, uh, Talk about some of the other things that were going on. That that entire podcast network that we were part of, the Schmoes Know or SK Plus, if you will, that podcast feed. Talk about that. And then as it evolved, we kept introducing more and more Collider talk, which Collider is the parent company, sort of what absorbed Schmoes Know, if you will. Sort of, It's kind of all the same thing. It, it can be confusing, but uh, Collider is basically the umbrella, if you will. Right. And so they had, um, they had some changes come up, and so Mark Fernandez now – owns Collider. He was previously working at Complex, but now he bought out that entire company. And, uh, yeah, he uh, shot us a message a month or so ago and said that uh, he was looking to do something with us and sort of uh, evolve what we were already doing, but to uh, sort of a new era, if you will, now after he had bought the company. And we... uh, we talked a little bit and we sort of picked up on what they were wanting to do. And so, and it's something we've sort of thought could be on the horizon for a while. Like yeah, it was we, something we've been anticipating. It is something that had been bounced around behind the scenes, but uh, yeah, I think Mark pulling the trigger on buying collider and getting the ball rolling on the podcast network and this and that sort of solidified things. We talked a little bit about that, show on after Schmo this past week but one thing that i wanted to be sure to do here is talk about why this is a big deal for sight and sound obviously it's a big deal for us right but it uh, again like i just said with the whole and it, i think it, it definitely i think it means something differently to both of us <laughs> yeah maybe, for sure and not just like there's what it means to both of us, but then it's like what it means for sight and sound yeah but like well, and when i say what it means for sight and sound i talk about the the personal brand that you and I are building, of course, and it's it, it's it's so funny to me. So, again, to sort of wrap up the the history after Schmo covering the Schmo's No Show, it is now evolving into Collider Afterthoughts, and we are now a Collider talk show that will exist on their brand new podcast network. As it sits right now, we will sit on the Collider Movie Talk feed, which is their flagship show. It'll be Movie Talk, Us, and Mailbag. And as it sits right now, it is the number two entertainment podcast or TV and film podcast. It's been bouncing back between number one and number two with another Collider show, Jedi Council. On iTunes. 
and it's really overwhelming for me, probably not for you, uh, but uh, it's to talk about why it's huge for sight and sound. Uh, I think we were told that our audience would easily double. Uh, we are, like I said, we will, we're now sort of in the game if you will, whereas we were sort of in the corner over here talking about the Schmoes No Show right. and the people that knew what Jay and I were doing for the, for that show and the industry, it was very limited. Uh, now we're in a position where pretty much everyone will be forced to know who we are and what we're made of and what we're capable of. And we're still sort of figuring out what the payment process is because we're not employees of Collider still, but part of the guarantee was that um, Sight and Sound will be plugged on their content and Jay and I will be present. Uh, our, our, our names will be present and it's just, it's going to change everything. Yeah. Um, and none of that's guaranteed, obviously. The So people that listen to this, they, they see all the sh- stuff we do week to week putting out youtube content podcast content and all this other stuff might be easy to look at what we do here as just this thing that we're doing we show up every single week there there is a plan in place and there has always been a plan in place a sort of business model if you will of how sight and sound would run um I've always been incredibly, both of us have always been incredibly honored with all the stuff that's come our way thus far. And we've never looked at it and said, this, these are things that have to happen. But I think if we were to take the temperature of where things are at right now with sight and sound, they're exactly where they, sh- they need to be in order for us to grow. Um, these little milestones that we hit are part of that business plan. And doing third party quote unquote programming, whether it it is a show like let's talk Legion, like we did or after Schmo or now afterthoughts, these are all levels of, of, of things, right? Doing let's talk Legion was a certain level after Schmo is a bigger level. This collider thing is an even bigger level. And we talk about, you know, I don't, I don't want people to think that like us even acquiring money or anything like that has anything to do with it has nothing to do with the business model right now our business model is to do good content goal number one goal number two grow our audience get more people involved with what it is that we're doing and you know to follow along with us and that's that's what we're selling right we're selling quality conversation and content across whatever we're talking about and then just our own personality. So it, it's, it means a lot for sight and sound ultimately. And I, I go back to a conversation that I had with Luke and a uh, group text that we have when he was sort of asking us about some of this stuff, what our goals were. And our goal is to grow so that we can do better content and more content ultimately. Um, Cause that's all I want to do. All I want to do in my life is just sit here and make content constantly. And be able to live my life doing it that way. And this is just uh, a step in that direction. But I don't want people to think that it's like, oh, that's it. Obviously, there's a long, 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 long road ahead. Many years ahead before that's ever going to happen. But it's a step in the right direction. Absolutely. Yeah. And it feels good. It feels good. Thank you to everybody that's reached out. <clears throat> and it, I know that it's something that sort of is on the outside for a lot of people, right? The more sure. the more shows that we do in these little pockets of music, movies, and television, uh, that you know the audience gets a little bit more separated. So, uh, if you were on the outside, if you're listening to this right now and you were on the outside, like I don't really understand what this is. It's okay. You don't have to. People don't have to understand. Just know that it's something that we're doing. I'd be curious to see if we're able to sort of utilize our talents and put some stuff out on Collider Factory too. I think that would be interesting. Yeah, that's, um, that's another part of the, the business I, model. They want it, so they just, do. Just let us, uh, let us do it, and uh, so yeah, that'll be cool too. Um, yeah, man, it's really uh, really exciting. So we, I think we finalized the album art today, which is pretty cool. Not well, podcast art, excuse me, the <laughs> artwork 
And uh, right now, my buddy Eric is uh, ferociously writing the theme song to Collider Afterthoughts. Um, So if you want to support my buddy Eric, he's in the Facebook group. You can say what's up to him. Follow him on Instagram because uh, he is a singer-songwriter working in Nashville right now. He he puts out his own content uh, on Instagram. So if you would, follow him at E. T. Mulder, M. U. L. D. E. R. Like the X Files agent. E. T. Mulder. Follow Eric and uh, show him some love. Yeah. Um, shout out to Eric Mulder and Brian Ward and Brian Ward doing, that, doing the artwork. doing the album or the artwork. The podcast artwork was very bizarre for me. Just I've never, I've never worked with another designer in that regard. <laughs> Just, I think. Did I wonder if you felt like how I feel when working with no. you? Hell no. It didn't bother you? Fuck no. Because <laughs> you never are, like you. You are completely different. Yeah. Well, I mean, if I could have, I would have given them notes, but Exactly. I didn't That's why it. I'm different because I sympathize and I empathize no, 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 with no, no. what he's doing and what's going on. I don't, In fact, I, don't, I was probably overtly like, hey man, just do whatever. You know? I, I don't mean I don't mean while he was working on it. Right. I wish I I wish I had seen the email promptly when you had, because I would have been like, hey, these are some ideas I'm going for. I'm a big fan of Late Night. Also had the idea. I wouldn't even do that, because that's my, that's what I'm saying. Well, I would. That's what I'm saying. I <laughs> coming, coming from that background, I know every single thing, every word, every phrase, every little tick that annoys a graphic designer. Just being coming from that position, and... In the same way that you've talked before about uh, being somebody in retail and knowing how to treat somebody who is working a retail job and customer yeah, but service. if a guy's de- if a guy's designing artwork, you don't think I have a right to just be like, hey, this is like I don't know this person, right? So if I'm like, hey, this is kind of the vibe, just so you can get an idea about what I'm like yeah. and some taste, like. I'm really into late night, and I had an idea. I thought it would be cool to maybe look like maybe a Marvel movie or something. It, I would, can, I, I would can't do just that. add that flavor just so he can get a sense of yeah. what the identity is. Yeah, and that's what I I did. I mean, I issued that. I said I gave him two things to sort of do his thing with. I I would be more hands on if it was somebody that I didn't trust. Right? If it, if I knew somebody was capable of doing something. Like they had the tools to do it, but I wasn't super confident in that they could pull it off easily and effectively. Then, yeah, I would handhold them. I would be more capable of handholding. For instance, uh, if you were going to do a podcast tomorrow about music, right? Even even something that you're, I know that you are capable of doing that podcast, right? Yeah. If you are going to go and design something i would probably you know give you a few things uh with that i had no interest i think i was pretty aware of his position so i had no interest of prolonging that back and forth yeah. that we were having like i was kind of already done like he had already done enough yeah for and sure. he went back to the drawing board once right and i was kind of like yeah, i don't want I've been challenging Eric, though, <laughs> for one, because he's my best friend, but two, because... You've uh, worked with him before, too, so... Well, that, and I told him that uh, I was going to be plugging in. By the way, I told him we uh, we would pay him, too, so I'm going to need your cut of the loot. But, um, but yeah. could have done it myself. <laughs> That's true. But uh, you can't play rock, Jay. Oh, I mean, I can. I've, I, I definitely Where's, can. You're going to pick up your guitar? I could show you a song right now that I, I wrote know. that I know. ripped off guitar <laughs> sounds that um, ripped off uh, bouncing composure back in the day. Yeah, I, I I wanted different. I wanted a different flair, but it, it's sort of like I you said it. though. It was it was funny that it was funny that for the first time we had someone else design our our art and outsource the the music too. I'm excited uh, for people to hear the the new theme song um, for uh, Afterthoughts. But uh, but anyway. Uh, is that the book end of that conversation? It is. Uh, let's take a break before we get into things because one, it'll make it easier on me when I'm putting in timestamps, this whole new method and everything that, uh, we're doing this new approach to the show. Um, I need to be more diligent. I think I was last week. Actually, I was last week. I put in some great timestamps, uh, in the description. So 
just know if you want to jump around, you're more than welcome to a jump around. There's a uh, timestamps in the description, but let's take a quick break. Um, get some Wawa and then we'll be back to talk about pop culture stuff. Goodbye. We'll, we'll be back. So Goodbye. Don't, don't leave. <laughs> One of the things that we are super proud of here at Sight & Sound is the Sight & Sound Facebook group. It was started by our very own listeners. The Facebook group is the place to be to not only interact with our fantastic community, you can debate with people, stay up to date with pop culture news. You can also interact with Ryan and myself. We're in there all the time. Check out the link in the description box of this podcast and join the group today. This was a crazy week of pop culture stuff. Like, too much stuff for me to even... Like, if we were doing the show like we were doing it with, like, one big topic for each thing, I wouldn't even know where to fucking start for music, man. This was... Did you did you know that I did my entire music episode this past week just release rundown? Like, that's all I did. Yeah, that's what it should be. No. No. You know why? Because it gets really fucking boring for me just to sit there and just talk about albums like that, like one after another. I'm do, you, like, sucks. do you have an expectation for yourself when it comes to how long the episode should be? No. I mean, sometimes I'd like them for them to be under an hour, if possible. Um, but sometimes, sometimes I like just... I like talking long form about one thing in particular. Like, but what if you just turn that into a sound off? What's that? That that portion. I did. That's what sound off is. <laughs> That's what I, I. Other than that, it's sound big. off is a rip of your podcast. No, sound off was what my podcast was, and now it lives on YouTube as individual video things. What I do, yeah. na- What I do now on the first half of that show, typically is like I did. Um, This week before all those releases were going to come out was just going to be Drake speculation, which is different from what a sound off would probably be. Yeah. I did that Under Oath album preview. It's essentially a, it's like a sight and sound weekly music topic done on my show. I don't want to talk about music yet, but I do want to tease the audience and you. If you know anything about me, you'll love this. Music? You're high on it right now. Is back, Jay. You're high on it. Music is back, and I'm falling more in love with it again. Let I me, know this. Let me. I knew this before you even said it. Let me tell you what I did last night. You responded night. to something last night, and I was shocked by it. Go let ahead. me tell you what I did. Not only is, it, is this a weird thing that I did in this particular instance, but I also have almost no history of doing anything like it, period, ever in my life. I ordered a Logic t-shirt. Oh, yeah? At his merch store. It's logical of you. Yeah. It's uh, very unlike me. I, there were days when I went into Hot Topic and bought a couple of band tees, but that yeah. was years ago. Other than that, totally out of character. We'll get to it. I go on. Oh, I thought I was <laughs> I thought I was going to look down and, and uh, see that I was wearing my Data Remember shirt, and then that would have been funny. I go through phases of like wanting to buy band merch sometimes, and then I realize how much I hate t-shirts because of how yeah sometimes they're good sometimes they're bad i love t-shirts sometimes they have longevity sometimes they don't um yeah well we the t-shirt i'm wearing now is like a fossil it's like if i was wearing a blockbuster polo we'll have a we'll have a i'm wearing a smooth no shirt (laughs) we'll have a whole like chunk of music stuff to talk about in a little bit Um, kick us off here yeah did you see uh, what happened with Tony Gilroy? You know, we just and- talked about this. You're playing it up as if we didn't just talk about it a second ago. <laughs> the only thing I know about this is what you told me, and so, it made me laugh, just the concept of it. A couple alone. of days ago in The Hollywood Reporter, uh, I guess that's where I read it. I don't know if that's what it originally started, but all these movie blogs just copy what everyone else started, so it's fine. Hey, at least at least you have uh, news for your section of the pop culture stuff. Yeah. Music is uh, fucking awful. Movie blogging is obsolete. Uh, <laughs> and movie content on YouTube is saturated because Collider and Screen Junkies just put out their... Did you see that? 
music did you, did music you, blogging hasn't even started. What did you see our YouTube subscriptions? Uh, I think it was today this morning. I laughed. No, I have my own YouTube. <laughs> I account. laughed my ass off. Guess what I saw in my subscriptions when I woke up? Screen Junkies, top ten Spielberg movies. <laughs> I mean, okay. Right after Collider's top 10. that I was like, okay. It's no different than you starting your uh, superheroes list that you abandoned. I, I'm not, no, I'm not, I'm not talking shit about the companies that right. do it or per se. I, I'm using that as evidence that. We're running out of ideas. Yes. Yeah. That's my point. Um, <laughs> But anyway, so Tony Gilroy. I can't wait till Screen Junkies drops more than movies. <laughs> <laughs> Tony Gilroy, if for those of you who don't know, he worked on like the Bourne films. He's a very he's a filmmaker that doesn't belong to Star Wars, but he came in to sort of doctor and take over the production of of Rogue One. If you didn't know that, so uh, Gareth Edwards is is the director credited for Rogue One. He's you know since day one he was quote unquote directing that movie. Tony Gilroy comes in after there's a director's cut. Right. So Gareth did his thing, made his Rogue One. Right. And they were in trouble. So Kathleen Kennedy, they hired Tony Gilroy to come in and sort of doctor this this movie. And we all sort of knew that there were reshoots. There are tra- uh, shots in the trailer that aren't in the movie or it's a different version. We all kind of knew that, uh, that things had been changed in post. Right. But you know, you kind of take each instance of that with a grain of salt because you have no idea if there was actually anything wrong or they just decided it didn't work as well, whatever. So he comes out, and he has no loyalty to Lucasfilm and Star Wars. He was a complete outsider. He doesn't belong in the family in the way that, like, a Favreau or a J.J. would. Right. So or he was Brian on... Brian Bird. Who? Brian Bird? Is no, no. Brad Bird. Brad Bird. Or Brian Burke. <laughs> Uh, anyway, you got you guys can see where it, there can be some confusion, especially <laughs> especially with CT. Well, all the people, <laughs> all of our movie fans are like, no, Jace. Um, anyway, he Brando's was on, like, I don't know who any of these people right, are. Right. Tony Gilroy was uh, a guest on Brian Koppelman's podcast, and he opened up about Rogue One. So I was just fascinated about some of these quotes. I just thought about how funny it would be that Brando w- was hearing this conversation because he was sorting through the timestamps to where to skip to. <laughs> uh, the the subtext of the article, the screenwriter who salvaged the Star Wars project, Rogue One, says the situation was so dire, all you could do was improve their position (laughs) so essentially what i'm getting this is my interpretation of this article is that rogue one was terrible yeah before he came in and fixed it and he was paid millions and we we sort of knew this he was paid millions for for this work uh and many consider him the film's ghost director even though he's credited as as the screenwriter and so he was talking about all the difficulty and confusion behind it and he was like when i came in all I could do is fix what they had. So I made the best with what I had is basically how he described it. And he said it was actually kind of simple for him to figure out. He was like, this movie is about sacrifice. Yeah. So he just formed it around that idea and we got what we got. He did a good job. I, um, I think I think Rogue One's a good movie. It's got its flaws. but He, he said that it's enormously different uh, than than Gareth's version. Even Ben Mendelsohn, who played Krennic, said that there's a completely different version of that movie that exists. Um, I just think it's funny to to hear, especially from this guy who ha- he doesn't care what he says about it. I've never been interested in Star Wars ever, so I had no reverence for it whatsoever. I was unafraid by that. They were in such a swamp. They were in so much terrible, terrible trouble that all you could do was improve their position. It doesn't appeal to me, but I don't think Rogue One is really a Star Wars movie in many ways. To me, it's a Battle of Britain movie. So I think that's interesting. I actually like that quote because you and I have talked about making different versions of Star Wars. Yeah, I mean, it's still 
it still feels like a Star Wars movie. I, I, mean, I agree. It, it doesn't feel like a Star Wars movie that we've seen before. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. It still feels like it belongs. Right. For sure. But uh, but anyway, I just thought all of that. It made a that, new hope better. I thought all of that was fascinating uh, because I think there's a lot of, and we do it too, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it, but sometimes we hear reports and things that don't always know everything about the situation. So there were a lot of band-aids on this story over the years. Right. It's just funny to see someone kind of rip those off and show the actual scars. You oh, know what I mean? Sure. Um, so it's just sort of, uh, it's, it's certainly ammo, I think for people who are questioning the direction of Lucasfilm, even though I don't necessarily fall into that category, it's certainly ammo, and gives people more of a, a a proper position on that stance, if you will. Let me right? ask you a question. Okay. Was do you, was there a documentary attached to Rogue One like there was with the other like most of the saga films? No. I mean, there's there's special features. It'll but, be it'll be a fascinating day when we get to see one of those t- styles of documentaries of a film that's been. I don't think we ever will. That's been littered say. in all of this trauma so to speak i don't think it, it's gonna be if we got it it would be year it, it would be decades well that's what before that's we thing can get some say. kind of tell all of yeah i mean it's going to be fascinating in 20 years or so when a lot of hollywood today this modern era of hollywood starts to write books and novels to tell about some of the behind the scenes stuff because well i'm i'm sure stuff like this has happened in the past i'm not saying it hasn't but the the film industry is so valuable, so volatile that they're just you know chopping and changing things behind the scene so much so that there are shows out there that exist that cover it on a daily basis, and it's just fascinating to me to be able to see all of this stuff. It's a lot of fun. I think it's a lot of fun to sort of talk about and speculate. Yeah. It makes you know. I mean, that's sort of what we develop a lot of our content around, but. It will be interesting to actually get to read about it in the future. Um, what's the book? Is it How Star Wars Conquered the Universe? Con- yeah, it'll be great to hear an, an updated version of that once the Disney era dust sort of settles. I think it's harder for that kind of stuff to exist. Um, it is today. For I sure. think old school Hollywood is one thing hearing about a lot of the things that happened like in the seventies when cinema was kind of dirty, if you will. Uh, and and like people like Spielberg and Scorsese, all those people were coming up Mm -hmm. and they were young and you know, the, all the stories about all the orgies and drugs that were going around and stuff like that. Like that's one thing, but because it's become so corporate, well, yeah, you, and there's NDAs flying around all, oh, I was all gonna over say, the place. So much, so much of this information is now privatized and censored. It's like people have been curious about the Fantastic Four production with uh, Josh Trank, and it's like, and, and people, people have joked about hearing that tell all. It's like I don't think that's ever going to exist because even even if Josh Trank was like blackballed from working with Fox ever again. Like, I feel like if he still said anything about it, he'd get served with some kind of yeah. bullshit. It's like, I don't know how much. Well, every now and then we get these like third party accounts or these shadowy figure cloak and dagger sort of, uh, descriptions of things that take place behind the scenes. We just had that one with the solo film where was it, um, entertainment weekly or who, or, Variety, maybe somebody came out. Some <clears throat> an an unnamed actor told all about the behind the scenes stuff, which right. it is fascinating, and you sort of have to filter it through a bullshit meter, I think, and what's real and what's not. But one, one of them, Lord or Miller, tweeted something out like, "Maybe don't believe everything you hear." Of course, and, <laughs> and they're going to they're going to right. I mean, yeah, that's that's acceptable too, but. I read stuff like that and think it's fascinating, but sure. because uh, we don't know who the source is and this and that, that you have to sort of take it with a grain of salt. What I will say, um, in defense of the people that are sort of questioning Kathleen Kennedy and Lucasfilm, it's like, I don't remember who it was. Maybe it was Ken Knapsack on Collider. 
uh, last week, but somebody just brought up the point, but it's like, how hard is it to, it was Snip, I think. How hard is it to make a fucking movie? Yeah. Like, I yeah, know, been I know, I know ma- making a movie is obviously difficult and a lot of work goes into it. That's not what I'm saying, but it's like, there are already so many examples of what's bad and what's good. It's like, there's no reason why some of this stuff should fail. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and, and it's again, usually people standing in their own way. The, the reason why, the reason why I'm saying I'm in defense of the people who are sort of questioning, like there's no way Kathleen Kennedy should have let rogue one be terrible to begin with. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, but these are also I've I've always found some of those conversations kind of interesting because I don't think that they're far off from some of the criticism that that they have in terms of they want to focus criticism in that direction and I think there's a place for it. But there's sort of a instance of you can't have your cake and eat it too because they want her to know about what's going on and they don't want people don't want her to let certain things get to this but, but, point. But, Jay. but hang on. So, but they also complain about how they want these directors to be able to create. So does that make sense? Yeah. You can't, you can't have your finger on the things that are going on, but also say, give me some space and distance. Which one do you want? Do you want Kevin Feige to be tapping people on the shoulder saying, Hey, what did you do today? Or do you want them to go and just make whatever movie they, they want to make? But Jay, why can't, why can't some of these folks just come out and say something like, oh, we just sort of changed our minds. Like, what if they were just a little bit more transparent? Like, yeah. in, in in this instance with Rogue One, it seems like he just made a movie that was not good, period. Which is like, that's sort of my question. Is like, wh- why do you let a film get so far to the point that it that it's bad and you have to bring in and pay another person a million dollars? But in in any other situation where they decide, hey, we just decided that we wanted to make something different. Maybe maybe this wasn't scary enough. We wanted to make it a little bit scarier. Sort of like with New Mutants. I think that that's interesting because yeah. that's pretty transparent. It's disappointing and unfortunate that the fans have to wait longer. Uh, and it. it but what the makes fact it, that they were just like, look, we so just weird. want to make this scarier. I think that's interesting. What makes New Mutants so weird is the fact that we've already got a trailer for it, right? Like, if we would have never gotten a trailer for that movie, and of course they had to, because I think by now it should have been out already. It would have been out in the next few weeks. Yeah, so I get it, but it's a little bit strange because they it won't come out until, what, 2019 now? <laughs> it's like we already saw a trailer for it. Um, yeah, I mean, I think there has to be something said, too. The creative pro. I've, obviously, I've never made a movie. I've never been on a set or anything. Oh, I've been on a set actually of uh, Elizabeth Town, but um, I've never, never done. You were on the set of Elizabeth Town. Well, yeah, it was shot in my hometown. But I went to the casting call. Yeah, they took my picture and everything, and I didn't get a call back. Yeah, I handed Orlando Bloom an L eight. You're fucking kidding! Me. I swear to God. <laughs> like, were you part of catering or something? No, they uh, or a PA. I knew somebody. I don't even remember who it was. Now, somebody was helping on the set, and they were just like, "Hey, do you want to come hang out for a little bit?" And I was like, "Sure." I mean, it, it was honestly as easy as somebody. You know how back in the day, it's like, "Hey, uh, my band's practicing. You want to come hang out?" It was like, "Oh as my easy, god!" As easy as that. I didn't get a call back. I mean, yeah, we could. I was wearing. Uh, like one of those JC Penny novel TTs in my picture. And it was just like it it was just like in this comic book font and it just said slacker on my shirt. <laughs> so they took a picture and I was just the guy that had the slacker shirt on it. It's probably why they didn't call me back. But my dad uh at the time was a bar manager mm-hmm. uh in Lexington yeah. downtown. So Orlando and Kirsten went to his bar mm-hmm. and he eventually got their autographs and I got their autographs. Uh couldn't give a shit less yeah. about either of those two actors. But, yeah, I was ha- uh, but I was hanging cool. out. It was outside of uh, this house that's downtown here, and um, it's the house in the movie where his family goes before and I think after the funeral in that movie. But anyways, they were all everybody was hanging outside. It was like a fucking barbecue, and I was just standing around, and um, I was standing in front of a cooler, and Orlando Bloom walked over and was like. 
whatever his accent is and was like, hey, man, uh, can you hand me a, a drink in there? I, I said, oh, yeah, what do you want? He said, oh, hand me an L8. I said, okay, here you go. <laughs> they handed it to him. It was that easy. Anyways, what were we talking about? Oh, yeah. Tony Gilroy. I've never, like, I've obviously never been a part of a movie or anything like that, but most creative process uh, that exists out there, when you're working on something, for even even when something seems bad, you can get it to a point where it's like, oh, okay, you just needed to do this and that. You know, maybe we just needed to do some editing to some more, you know what I'm saying? Like, ah, these dailies, they're kind of wonky, but maybe they'll come together. You know, maybe it's a sense of that. They're just trying to give people as much, you know, I'm sure the stuff with Ron Howard and Solo went right down to the wire, obviously. Obviously it did, right? I mean, they had to pull the trigger pretty fucking quick by the way we are recording this episode of sight and sound weekly uh on saturday night tomorrow sunday a day before this episode drops brand new solo trailer will have dropped awesome. so we cannot comment on it here you can't maybe we'll do a video or i'll do a video of some kind i don't know because my work schedule fucking sucks but maybe i can get something together and we can uh, talk about the solo trailer but uh, somewhere else you got anything else for this uh specific story I was just thinking about how fascinating it would be if Foggy or Kathleen Kennedy were just more transparent. It's like if Kathleen Kennedy just came out at at, uh, at Star Wars Celebration, for example, when she, they just completely ignored a solo because it was right after they dropped, I would have loved it if she came out and was like, look, Lord and Miller made this movie and it was just like a stepbrother's version of Solo. And I, I didn't want to do that to you guys. <laughs> So yeah. I'm bringing in Ron Howard, and they just sort of played up the excitement. And just like, I, I, I would have been fascinated. Obviously, I know that there are things that factor into that. Like, maybe that'll eventually hurt hurt the brand or hurt the stocks or hurt the product event or the the uh, the box office. Yeah. But I would be, it would be amazing to live in a world where all of that information just sort of roamed free. Yeah. I, I mean, listen. I'm fascinated by talking about it to a certain extent. I think ultimately, at the end of the day, none of it honestly really makes a that much of a difference. I just don't think it's a big deal. Obviously, it can mean whether a movie is good or bad or not. But once a movie has come out, and I've, like this Tony Gilroy stuff, it's it's cool. It's it's cool to talk about. But the movie that I saw, it was pretty good. So just ultimately, none of it really matters, right? Like. Does it matter that we never got to see that TIE fighter fly up in front of, uh, what's her name in that movie? Well, it'll, it matters to some people, I guess. If, if, if they were excited by that shot, it's like, and maybe think it would, it could turn out cooler than what we actually got. It's like with this, and we'll talk about the Under Oath album in a little bit. This Under Oath album, there's two bonus tracks that came out on the Target version of it. Yeah, sure, I want to hear those songs, but the album that I got was pretty good, and having them isn't going to change much for me. It's just there are other songs that exist. Um, they're not canon, so to speak. So, yeah, I don't know. It's just interesting. Like, I wonder if anybody's going to comment on our review and be like, yeah, but did you hear those bonus songs, though? It's like, no, I didn't hear them. I heard 11 other tracks. Anyways, I... uh I think it's fascinating that this weekend uh, <laughs> so far this year is probably the most like critically and successful weekend of at the movies since Black Panther because A Quiet Place is bumping right now. We ha only have the Friday box office numbers, but it's done 19 million so far, which is dope, critically praised. Blockers also seems to be tremendous fun. Uh, Friday it came in at like I think it's nine million or something like that. So both movies are doing really solid. They're both critical. I, I I'm just super excited uh, that this is going down. I'm very disappointed that I'm not going to be able to get to the theater. But uh, I also think it's cool because these are two both movies are great representatives of genres that I have not been keen on in yeah. a long time. I mean, good comedies are few and far between. I'm not the biggest horror fan at all. 
it like 2016 was great for horror for me. I remember f- just pumping my fist watching Don't Breathe, but uh, but other than that, it's hard for me to get excited about those kinds of films. So it's great to see that they're having this kind of weekend. Yeah, I think the thing that excites me the most about a movie like Blockers and like A Quiet Place is the fact that they're fun movies which plays into the I think the temperature of Hollywood right now but uh but they don't they're still champions of original content. Does that make sense? Yeah. Like so you have a movie like uh Pacific Rim or Pacific Rim Uprising that falls into that niche, right? But it, it it's walking like a Hollywood big blockbuster movie and it's talking like one and it seems like one but people just aren't responding in the same way that maybe they would for a Marvel film, obviously. Yeah. So it's nice to see um, that movies like this can come out, can exist, and people are interested in them. Um, Yeah, I celebrate anything. Well, first of all, as far as comedies go, it, it seems crazy to me that we live in a landscape where comedic movies like this just aren't as celebrated as, as it, they used to be. Isn't it funny that comedy... It's bizarre. Comedy movies are terrible. It's bizarre. I mean, the I past remember... past five years... The I heyday mean, of, of Judd Apatow movies, like, you know... And not even not even that, but think about the 90s. Sandler, well, yeah. Jim Carrey. I mean, it was non-stop in the 90s. But yeah. as the 2000s progressed, comedies just became... Few and far between. N- not... N- not joking here. It, it became the laughing stock of Hollywood because at least horror. You might get like one celebrated one a year. Like last year, it was like the the big sick was one, and, and but that's not even the one. That's not even what I'm talking about when I'm talking about comedies, right? Like forgetting Sarah Marshall, things or, like well, things like even uh, Baywatch to a certain extent. That yeah. should be part of Baywatch and like. Uh, Zach, what was that movie? Zach Efron and uh, Robert De Niro, Dirty Grandpa, like right. things like that. Uh, even Sasha Baron Cohen, he doesn't hit anymore. The right. di- I thought the Dictator was terrible, and then everyone forgot about uh, Brothers Grimsby or Gr- that yeah. came out the weekend of Ten Cloverfield Lane. But like these comedies just come out and they're just terrible, forgettable. I mean, Bridesmaids and Jumanji. Jumanji's Jumanji an exception. is still great. I'm gonna. I do want to watch. It's it. great. I think um, it's fucking amazing. The the people that are reacting to a quiet place though, uh, I'm just so thrilled because I was wanting this movie to do well. I I, I want to see it so badly. And I'm curious if whether or not a movie like this gets some buzz going. I mean, obviously I haven't seen it yet, but just judging by the critical praise of it, if if a movie like this doesn't perk some ears. For award season, specifically because of what Get Out did last year. I don't year. know, maybe you know, uh, but we have to consider that now, right? We we can consider that yeah. now. Yes, um, exciting. Yeah, I I I hope that I'm pumping my fist in the way that I did it. Don't breathe, because that was just so much fun, and I hope that it's the best Cloverfield quote unquote movie of the year. Uh, I think it's going to be without a doubt, based for on. Sure. Based it's a movie that I'm going to see uh, this, maybe tomorrow. I'm going to go see that over Ready Player One. Oh, really? I've elected to let Ready Player One just be something I rent. Okay. Yeah. Um, speaking of John Cena, star of Blockers, I listened to him on uh, It's No Longer the Nerdist podcast, the ID10T podcast. It spells out idiot, if you're curious. Um John Cena was on, and John Cena just straight up talked for an hour, yeah, without letting Chris say anything. And reminds me of Saturday Night Weekly. I was I was hoping to I was sort of in the mood because WrestleMania is going on, and I had wrestling on my mind, even though I haven't been into wrestling for a long time. I was excited to hear him talk. He he made like one or two points about the reality of wrestling. Yeah, and somehow made those two points last an hour, and it was just exhausting. 
Interesting. I don't know why I listened to the whole thing. I, uh, he, he really annoyed me. Let's not talk about John Cena anymore. I let's, just want to let's talk about that. wrestling in general. We were talking off air. I don't know the status of wrestling right now in popular culture. I know. So my own trajectory, not my own trajectory with it, but my own understanding of the trajectory of wrestling. I know it's always been popular, right? I mean, it's silly to just say that, but there was a time, I think you and I both kind of grew up in a time where it kind of crossed over into like, there's like this sphere. I feel like that it crossed over into of the greater consciousness, the attitude era of WWF, uh, the WCW, WWF nitro and, Raw is war, war. That was a huge time. And then I feel like it kind of dipped out of the zeitgeist a little bit more and um, kind of became something like, oh, you watch wrestling. But now it, fe it feels like it's back. It feels like it's back firmly in the consciousness may for a few reasons. One, because I don't know if it's specifically because of the bubbles that we're in and we're in this sort of nerd fandom bubble and that's something that's a part of it as well or i but i also feel like people now aren't necessarily into wrestling but they're into the nostalgia of wrestling like there was just that rick flair 30 for 30 that was on espn that i heard a ton of people checking out brendan job for instance went out and just bought a bunch of wrestling stuff doesn't watch it at all but is wearing like macho man t-shirts and stuff like that now and even myself, like, I, I remember going to a bar one time and seeing classic wrestling matches on the TV at this bar and being super into it. I think it has everything to do with the circles that we run in now. With that, before social media, that's that's when wrestling died off. And that's when it felt, at least where we came from, we got to a certain age and, and then it felt like uh, watching wrestling was unacceptable. It, it sort of feels like wrestling only made sense to adults who at the time grew up with it, like, say, yeah. my dad, who got me into wrestling, right? So he grew up in an era where wrestling was, like, really starting out and coming up. That era, and yeah, that's exactly so what it comes it, down to, like, right? It, it's it like dads, children, but for whatever reason, in our preteens and teens, not to say that there aren't fans, but in my life, it became sort of unacceptable to to like that. But now, because we're in the age of social media, and the fact that we are running in the circles specifically that we're in now, we're realizing that there are wrestling fans closer than what we originally thought. You know what's funny though about wrestling, and this is uh, this is obviously just my opinion. I don't have anything specifically to back this up, but um, I feel like what wrestling is and what wrestling does, being being sports entertainment and just centering around drama, but also these physical things that are happening inside of a ring. I feel like it's something that sports, for instance, just normal sports, NFL, NBA, soccer, baseball, they look at something like WWE as a, a business model, right? They can't, I mean, allegedly, they can't rig their sporting events, but there is an investment, a business investment in and having people watch things that aren't actually going on on the field, on the court, and whatnot, right? The speculation in between things. Right. That drama. Sports want that. They want that drama built into it. Don't get it twisted. Uh, John Jones running over a pregnant woman, obviously a terrible thing. But guess what? It's great for business. They want a piece of that pie. Well, I mean, that's what's so uninteresting to me about the NFL. And that's Vince McMahon's point right. with, with starting XSFL back up. It's because he's like, look, I think that we have counter-programming here, and I think it's going to do really well. I wish, I wish Major League Baseball took things from the WWE. Right. Like, if we could have some of the WWE flair to actual sports, I think it would make that much more interesting. That's why the NBA is more interesting to follow because these athletes have voices. And when you hear things like, I think it was J.R. Smith a couple of years ago, there were several games where at the free throw line, he would just bend down, reach over and untie someone's shoe. <laughs> like yeah. stuff like that is great, but you don't hear that a lot. 
with, say, like the NFL. And if anybody acts a fool in the NFL, they just get fined out the ass. There's no character yeah. to the NFL at all, and it's extremely boring to me. Like, Terry Bradshaw is an anomaly when you compare him to the zombie, the nothing, no personality of Tom Brady. It's like Terry Bradshaw is one of a kind <laughs> when you look at – yeah, who these people are. So, but but there's there's obviously outliers in that regard. I mean, you have somebody like Deion Sanders, who was very very boisterous and not he was a, a, a two sport athlete. I mean, there was that whole thing as well. Somebody like Terrell Owens or a Chad Johnson. But they there, there are things that people there are things that the athlete themselves can do without acting like an idiot, right? I I think that. I, I, I get part of where these athletes are coming from. I think a lot of them do it because they don't want any distractions. Some or they the reason they, they might just not be well, entertainers in that. Well, regard. the reason, but they're they're trained to be certain ways though too. Like mm. they are. No, eh. they literally are. In what <laughs> what way? What are you talking about? All of them, even you, you mean like the professional side of them to answer questions a certain way? And yeah, this, yeah, absolutely. Like even I Kentucky, thought I thought you meant from the approach of like they're they're meant to be entertaining. No. Yeah. yeah, yeah no. Like definitely. even for those of you who don't know, like when uh, recruits come in and they start to play for Kentucky, they're literally trained on how to handle the media starting at the age of 18. And players in the NFL, especially quarterbacks, are discouraged from saying anything interesting, period. They have to be boring. Same with coaches because – and some of it – some of it is in there. Some of it is them – being that way it's in their best interest but some of it is them being restricted as well i I know a lot of them want to say more than they can but they're also maintaining a sense they they don't want to distract they don't want any distractions in the locker room because it's all about business and getting the job done and they don't want to be flying off the handles bitching about blah 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 that's why colin kaepernick is such um such a thorn in the side of the nfl even though it's criminal that uh, he is still unemployed. But uh, but regardless, that's why that's such a big deal is because it's so against everything that they want to, to be doing there. Well, the, so There's also something to be said, too, though, real quick. There's something to be said for people that maybe want to do this job as an athlete but don't want any business doing something like that. So they're doing all that they can to mitigate being an even bigger star than they already are. Right. I mean, not everybody specifically wants the limelight in that regard. I've, I mean, there's people uh, that will just outright avoid the media specifically because they just don't want anything to do with that. There, there are hints. I guarantee Aaron Rodgers wants to speak the shit. Of course. About this Colin Kaepernick situation in defense of Colin Kaepernick. Of but, course, but that's one person, right? But it, it, I guess what I'm what I'm saying is, I wish that Aaron Rodgers is privileged enough because he's the best at what he does. He's privileged enough to not give a fuck in the ways that like Deion Sanders and Chad Johnson eventually just not stop giving a fuck because they put themselves in a position. That's why I think Tom Brady is just naturally boring. Because Tom Brady so the, should be able to do anything he fucking wants. But the sport, the because there's a sport value. out there that does that does all of these things that you're talking about to a certain extent without having the individual athletes be the center focal point of that. And that's soccer. Soccer is a year round, 365 a day, year sport. I mean, it's, it never stops. There is constant drama and the athletes themselves could not be less interesting if they tried. It has nothing to do. What about Zoltan? That's not his name. What is it? His name is Zlatan. Zlatan. <laughs> Ibrahimovic. And yeah, that he's an anomaly. The man is he's um, fucking nuts. He's almost 40 fucking years old and yeah. he's one of the best players in the entire world. Crazy. Um, he's amazing and he can kick your fucking head off. So but, but no, the the way that <laughs> the way that soccer and I don't mean kick your head off cuz he's a soccer player. He's a trained he's trained in taekwondo. Um he has literally been in fights with uh U.S. soccer players. Anyways, the way that soccer handles all that stuff is the media makes the entertainment for uh, the sport, if that makes sense. They do not have 
salary caps in soccer. So you just get these ridiculous and absurd deals being made where people are like, is this person going to sign? Are they not going to sign? They're fucking following around soccer players in cars like the paparazzi trying to figure out if they're going to sign these deals or not. I mean, it's, it, it, it's crazy. The media themselves need to get, need to get their head out of their own ass and stop regurgitating the same, well, the trade deadline is going to close. Fuck your trade deadline. Like, I want to know that, that LeBron James is hanging out with Drake. <laughs> Tell me. Tell me those. Well, I think. I mean, if you don't consider soccer to be primary, well, you, no one should. The the American, the closest to that is the NBA, because oh, the absolutely. players actually have voices. And uh, Adam Silver, even though he doesn't know shit about basketball, I don't care what you say. He, so, but basketball is one of the least profitable sports in America. Uh, if you look at the actual business model of the NBA, it's actually on a downturn. That which one of the reasons why they've had to turn to. Uh, adding sponsorships to the jerseys and whatnot. It's one of the least attended well, sports. Th- that they're thinking about getting uh, getting involved in gambling, which is yeah. F- that would add again more closely soccer. God, related. that would add billions of dollars to their revenue. It yeah, would be, it would be absurd. I think like the the deal would be that they get one or two percent of the money that's being dealt uh, dealt for for bets. Like that would be an astronomical. The best thing that could happen to basketball, in my opinion, is for uh, ownership percentages, the cost to go down so that more entertainers can buy them. It does so much business. The fact that to- the Toronto Raptors have a Drake night every, every season <laughs> yeah. and that he sits courtside. I mean, it's huge. The, the worst. The worst team. Name. One of the worst things about American sports is the f- dumb fucking names of the teams. The Reds. Raptors. No, nah, I'm not even talking about that. Raptors are badass. Jeff. No, it's not. Y- any sports team. Canadian Raptors. <laughs> any sport. Any sports team that has a fucking animal as their name is stupid as hell. Like that's not true. I, absolutely, it is. That's why it's amazing. One of my favorite things about soccer is it's the whatever such and such football club like Jay. that's fucking great like nobody oh, wants your stupid God. shitty cartoon mascot get out of here Jay. i don't even know what a laker is what's, i don't know what exactly what's cooler is. a raptor or a laker a laker because i don't know what it is no a raptor a, what about the 76ers stupid. how shitty stupid. of a name is absolutely that? it's stupid we don't need mascots get rid of the mascot the cincinnati reds logo is literally a toilet seat the browns the browns and the it's an Cubs. orange helmet. The white What the hell socks. are you doing? Yeah, socks. The Give me Yankees. a break. Anyway, the whole the point Dolphins? was that a dolphin can't play football. Get that helmet off that dolphin, Sid. You ever think about that? Why is a dolphin wearing a helmet? Let's move on. We were, Sports, we were talking about uh, we were talking about wrestling. So anyway, I I I've been thinking about going back and getting the the WWE service. You should. I want to rewatch the all of the stuff that I grew up on. I would on a week to week basis. I would love to just start from like it would have been like ninety six probably when I got into it. Paul Barry's got the urn. I just want to watch Monday Night Raw. Yeah, and through Stone Cold breaking his neck. I mean, that was that wasn't even like peak Stone Cold. That was like 98, 99, and he was like out for a year. Yeah, but that wasn't Peak Stone Cold. Peak Stone Cold was... Uh, Peak Stone Cold was when he brought in a milk truck. No. And Pe- a Pe- beer truck. Peak, yeah. Sto- Peak Stone Cold was WrestleMania with Mike Tyson versus Shawn Michaels. That was Peak Stone Cold. Was Boston. that when Mike Tyson was the guest ref? Yes. That was Peak Stone Cold. Right before that, um, you know, he won King of the Ring he he broke his no. neck via uh, that pile driver from Owen Hart. Rest in peace. Right, but the way that it was written into the show, your boy knows some wrestling. The history. way that it was written into the show, though, is that there was a uh, an insert of a limousine running over him, and that was part of the that was the show element to it. But obviously, when he talks about it, it's because the pile driver fucked him up. I'm he pretty, finished I'm that sure, match. I'm pretty sure that 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 
they played it up from that match because it built up a rivalry between them. Because he, I remember him doing. Actually, they ended up outlawing out. Wow, outlawing that uh, that pile that version of the, the pile driver. Mo- I remember specifically him having neck issues and being written out of the WWE because a limousine hit him in a parking garage. Okay, that's all I'm saying. But Sounds no, Peak Stone Cold was him going after w- when him and McMahon were going back and forth. Oh, absolutely. And there was that cage match between him and McMahon that had all the blood pouring out everywhere. And seeing them, uh, I remember Vince McMahon just like, f- Stone Cold would beat the piss out of Vince McMahon. And Vince McMahon, uh, Stone Cold would leave the ring so that he could win. And Vince McMahon would just hold two birds up and he'd be like crying with blood pouring down his face and Stone Cold couldn't help himself but to go back and keep beating the shit out of him because he was getting flipped off. That that was peak Stone Cold. That was driving in the beer truck and the milk truck and uh, and all that, man. So I, I just want to do that all over again. I think it would be so much fun. Um, We did something this week. Hmm? We did something this week. We did another... Uh, um, I got one more thing. I have a take. What? I have a take. What's your take? Here, Here's what I want to do. I tweeted this out. I like to talk about the things that annoy me about film punditry. There, Sometimes I watch a lot of Collider. I watch a lot of film, Twitter, and YouTube, and all this stuff. And sometimes I hear things that become a commonality, things that all of these people agree with. And every time it comes out of their mouths, I think, no, that's not even real. That's not even true. That's not why this happened. So in this this week's edition of correcting film Twitter, Edge of Tomorrow is not to blame for that movie's box office success. That title is a good title. That title makes a whole lot of sense with what the movie is actually about. The characters are forever on the edge of tomorrow because today repeats itself. All You Need Is Kill, the title of the graphic novel that that movie is based on, not only does that movie not make any sense grammatically, but if you name a movie that, it just becomes, it sounds like a cliched, Revenge movie. All you need is kill is a horrible title <clears throat> for what that movie is. This is uh this is this happened on Twitter. It's I've been hearing it for five years. Yeah. And it's just one of those things, kind of like kind of like when you were like, Why is it why is everybody hating on the Dark Knight Rises all of a sudden? We were just like, Did right. we just one day wake up and start bl- like it's this common thought or theory that all of these people have, and I just want to shake them every time they say it because it's like, what are you talking about? It's kind of like when it, it, it's kind of like the people that blame Star Trek Beyond's success on the fact that that teaser trailer played sabotage. That has nothing to fucking do with it because it's not a big deal. That it wasn't a problem that that song was in the movie makes uh, this is the hip hop rock and roll version of Star Trek and this was the third movie we were already used to the rock and roll Star Trek and that song plays a role in this character's life it makes absolute sense and has nothing to do with the fact yeah. that it underperformed case in point i don't think i should have said that but i'm just tired of seeing this stuff being said because it makes no sense to me when when film Twitter... You can catch these says, rants and more on Ryan Selling's movie show. Making its return this Thursday. That rant took me two minutes. I can't sustain a movie podcast. Yeah, you can. It nope. would have been, been great there. Nope. All right, so let's talk about... Uh, actually, let's, I want to touch on a little bit of TV first. Um, stumbled upon... Actually, I didn't stumble upon this. I can't, I can't take credit for this. Uh... Carl, my buddy Carl Bragg, reached out to me this week and asked me if I had watched Rapture on Netflix. Like most things that are recommended to me, I usually just disregard them. Um, Didn't even give it a second thought. 
opened up Netflix and saw it and thought, hey, I remember I mentioned something about this. Usually I have to just find it on my own. And uh, I didn't know anything about it. I didn't know what Rapture was. We just watched Leftovers. Wasn't that Rapture enough for you? Oh, uh, God. W- so I dug into it and found out that it's this interesting new Netflix original sort of documentary series where each episode follows a different rapper. Uh, so that's obviously right up my lane. Um, some of the people that are featured on there, I don't really have much knowledge of, and I probably just need to watch it and find and let it educate me about these individuals like Boogie with a hoodie and uh, people like that. But the first episode I was very, very intrigued by, and it was Logic. Uh, Logic, obviously, last year had probably his most successful year ever. Um, not probably, had without a doubt his most successful year ever. This documentary, first of all, let me just say that it it told the story of his success so well that it, it actually shed some light on how successful he was that even I don't think I had a full grasp on how big he sort of broke last year. Ryan and I both really enjoyed his album, Everybody, that came out. And um, I think it was probably my highest ranked hip hop album of 2000. And uh, 17, um, I checked it out, thoroughly enjoyed it, suggested it to you. Uh, what d- what made you decide to throw this on last night? Um, did you stumble upon it kind of like nothing I did? in particular? I mean, I just had Netflix open, and yeah. I was I was looking for something to watch. I didn't really want to watch a movie, so I saw that pop up, and I I remembered it, and. Right. Uh, I have been listening to Logic more recently. I mean, we just got his album a few weeks ago, so he was he was uh, on my mind. And uh, you prefer the mixtape or everybody? Which one? I don't know yet. I'll tell you what. After watching I mean, the documentary, I, I just, it made me want to go back and just right? spend even more time with everybody. Me too. Me too. Definitely. Uh, especially just kind of knowing some of the stuff comes from now. Uh, a song like uh, "Take It Back" really spoke to me. Because he says he he says so much of his story in that song, right? Of course. So I was still familiar, like when he was talking about it in the documentary. That sort of song, kinda. it's weird because it's a banger song, but you throw this like spoken word sort of interlude yeah. in the middle of it. It makes it not it's really, like a six minute song, not applicable to radio. So it's uh, it's fascinating. Yeah, um, I'm surprised. Actually, I don't remember our early conversations about Logic, really. But I'm surprised that <laughs> you didn't sit me down and say, Snelling, if there was ever a rapper that was for you, it's Logic. Um, because... Well, I mean, most of rap music, rap music in general, doesn't really register on the algorithm. I mean, I it, it does in the sense where... If it's a banging track, like, I know you're probably going to enjoy it. But it's that, but it's also something that's just substantial. Right. I mean, there's obviously, there are things intertwined with, within Logic Story that I think is appealing to you. But again, but like, I, like I say all the time, especially with more than music, like... Everybody's kind of like the no hope of rap. People aren't going to invest themselves into music unless they dig deeper. And a lot of people don't have the time and energy to do that. And music is not fucking doing it for you. And that is a commentary on music. There are There is not enough things like Rapture that exist in music. And if there was more, I guarantee you, music would have a bigger piece of the pie in the pop culture landscape. Yeah. So what I'm finding is that he is the rapper for me. And I told you last night, and it, it might, I might sound like popular opinion guy. Musically and outside of that, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and this documentary helped with that, to your point. Uh, I might have sounded like popular opinion guy uh, last night, but I was like, Logic is my favorite rapper. I mean, it might be an easy choice because I listen to so little rap, but it's just, it's everything else that he stands for. Yeah. And hearing his story, it just, it was just really powerful and just it really, really spoke to me. I mean, he, he, since I've been listening to his music, his music, his music has spoke to me 
uh, more than any of them. That's why I gave everybody a shot, continue to listen to everybody. That's why I was excited to listen to Bobby Tarantino too, and that's why that stays with me as well. This was just sort of the cherry on top. This it, it was funny because this was a little bit longer than some of the other episodes. I believe it clocked in at around an hour and ten minutes. Just over an hour. Yeah, yeah. and um, it was such a great watch. Kayla and I actually sat down and watched the entire thing together, which surprised me because it's something I don't think she would typically pay attention to. It was just so well done, so well shot. The narrative was great. Did a great job of... I'll tell you what this documentary did a fantastic job of. It was telling just how hard he works and how much time and energy and effort and care he puts into what he does and how he's gotten to where he is. Right. It also sheds a ton of light on what... So I've watched two episodes at this point. I watched the Logic one and I watched the Two Chains one. And it sheds a lot of light on what it looks like to be at this level, this top level, but still how much you have to treat your brand, your business as almost a corporate entity because there's so many people underneath of you that are relying on you. Um, in the 2 chains one, when he hurt his leg, when he broke his leg, it was a huge issue because his team, if he didn't get to go on tour, it would have been like his shop or his store being closed for Black Friday. Does that make sense? Like, yeah, it's a huge business issue. Um, and we see that with logic in this. For those that haven't watched it, we see this with logic when he's preparing his tour and how much care he's putting into fine tuning, like the timing of the visuals and the lighting, like those decisions have to be made by somebody. Yeah. You can farm some of that out to a team, but a true auteur of how they're, presenting their body of work they're going to want their fingerprints on all that there was a my <laughs> ride with this documentary was interesting because there was a small portion where he kind of annoyed me he what I, yeah there was a, a chunk of this where i was kind of like all right dude you need to relax a little bit because with what so his um his a his quote-unquote management approach to how he was handling some of his um working with some of his performance team and his his band uh I didn't agree with personally but you know to tell each, me why to each you, their own tell me why you couldn't get this done yeah there, let's fix it yeah there's there's certain aspects of that I didn't specifically agree with which is fine it's not a big deal I'm not, I'm not even going to criticism for it. it's just an approach that I wouldn't have not going to criticism for it I'm not going to criticize him for it but that's <laughs> not a, an approach I would take but um where I d sort of came back around to it is just when all that's washed away, when all the, the planning and everything and the stress of planning is washed away, he still shows up and he performs and he's obviously is passionate about it. He enjoys it. The icing on the cake for this whole documentary for me was when he was talking about the things that he had accomplished in the year, but he hadn't taken the time to actually think about it. And the man broke down, started crying, and it was so honest and so real. And that's the type of stuff that not only do we just not get enough of in music, we definitely don't get enough of it in rap and hip-hop because so much of it is about being boisterous and especially in male-driven rap and hip-hop, like this sort of macho, masculine sort of approach to things. Like, right. I mean, it's, it's looked down upon to show emotion in rap and hip-hop, even though it's a little bit more prominent today. Um, what else stuck out to you about this? Uh, Did you cry? Fuck yeah. No, I didn't. Uh, I don't cry, but um, I got as close to as I probably ever would. Uh, I laugh at people when they cry. Like it, le <laughs> it legitimately makes... Did you laugh at that uh, Asian kid? I could not hold it together. Why? I was laughing so fucking Gee. hard. I was just like, be cool. <laughs> be cool. <laughs> he was acting a fool. Collect yourself, guy. Collect yourself. Don't be too much of a fan. If somebody came to me I think crying it, like that, I would be like, dude, you got to you gotta get it together. <laughs> you don't think that Logic maybe saved that kid's life? Like he was going yeah. through something and Logic's music Absolutely. changed everything and for him. You know what? That's great. But it doesn't make it any less funny to me <laughs> to see you crying, snot running down your face. That and... The fact that he was holding his phone. <laughs> Yeah, 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 like, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's just very 2018. But uh, yeah, that moment and um, oh fuck, what was the other I think moment? Him and his wife might oh, be getting a divorce. 
They are. Yeah. They are getting a divorce. Yeah. Which is super sad when you watch that documentary. Isn't and she isn't she the cover of his album? She's, she's the girl. Yeah. Yeah, she's in the album. Yeah. She's the his wife. He, he uh he got the band from um what? That show that you like, uh Curb Your Enthusiasm. He did that whole thing. Where the band played outside of her window on her birthday. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, that's kind of sad. But anyway, I got so fucking hyped. It, it kind of made me tear up when... With the kid? The kid was yeah, on stage was rapping. Dope. Oh, my God. That was so cool. Yeah, definitely so a highlight. Cool. But no, it, it just kind of met... And when they were talking about the 1-800 song and just all that kind of stuff, and to see that... That's a song that's he ta is, taken a second win for me because... When, on the album, I didn't care for it that much, and now I think it's great. I think it's such a great song. I mean, it's 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 an anthem for a lot it, of people. It's, it's just a and, good song, too. Yeah. I mean, it's like strip away the meaning of it and all this other stuff. It's he. Uh, I just think he's such a genuine guy, and uh, I don't know. I'm just such a massive fan of his. Yeah. I'm so glad I watched it. Yeah, it's great. Everybody, if, if you do watch it, please watch it. That's like the your homework in terms of if you're going to watch anything from this documentary, definitely watch that episode, but treat yourself to the two chains episode. It's a completely different vibe. <laughs> it's so entertaining. It's, I mean, and I, I don't mean this in a negative way, but he's such a character. He's like the Michael Scott of, of rap music. <laughs> like, it's amazing. You just can't believe that it's real. And it yeah. makes me so happy. Um, but no, what I was going to touch on a little bit earlier is uh, we did a, a album review together for this new Under Oath album, which was nice because I like doing the keep talking. I'm going to go. The pee. I, I like doing the reviews together. We were granted access to uh, do the review early by Under Oath's PR team, which is really really cool and exciting because anytime anytime we get uh, to do something early, it's obviously beneficial for our YouTube channel, but. I'm very intrigued by uh, by the response of this Under Oath album because it is such... And if you're not a fan of Under Oath, it's okay. You can stick with us uh, for this conversation. It's going to be pretty broad, and I think it has some bigger picture uh, discussion points with it. But this was an album from, from a band who hasn't put out an album in 10 years, and naturally bands are going to change. They're going to progress over time. But coming into this album they had put out songs that were polarizing towards their fan base. And strangely enough, taking the temperature of some of the reactions from this album, I haven't seen, personally, I haven't seen a ton of people having backlash for it. I haven't seen a ton of people saying, this isn't my under oath. I've seen some, but it doesn't seem like that's the overwhelming. Not, not as polarizing as you thought. Yeah, Absolutely. What I'm the most intrigued by coming into next week, especially because we're putting a lot of the under oath stuff to bed, um, we've got a few more things that we're going to cover. I'll talk about that in a second. But so on any other given week, I would say that this under oath album is a lock, a lock for a number one debut because the 10 year gap the fandom that they have, the niche fandom, the diehard fandom, and the the way they have marketed this album coming out, people bought this thing in droves. They were pre-order pre selling out like crazy. Great pre-order packages. If you bought, so I bought the vinyl, right? After we heard the album, heard that it was good, bought the vinyl. Not only did, I was always going to probably buy the vinyl because it was such a good deal. You get the vinyl record, digital version of it, and you get an, a one-hour-long documentary. On vinyl? Not on vinyl. But you get uh, a one-hour-long documentary. Like, why would you not spend $20 for that? It's a fucking great deal. People were snatching up like crazy. Uh, exclusive release via Target with two bonus tracks. Great marketing idea. Sold out in tons of Targets across the country. The issue with this being a number one album is they couldn't have picked a worse day <laughs> to release this album. So many huge albums came out this week. A lot. Cardi B's, 
30 Seconds to Mars, and a, a bunch of other people to sort of disperse people's purchasing habits. So this is going to be a fascinating week, I think, to sort of wrap our heads around where music business is at. Because on one hand, we have a bunch of people buying a physical release. I didn't realize you were talking about number one all time. I thought you meant... Well, not... Not, not all time. I mean... Billboard number one yes, album. Yes, I thought you meant rock charts. No. Brand new. Their album hit number one yes. when it came out. To me, it seems like they have all the pieces to be a number one album. I mean, they're putting bill they're putting billboards up in Times Square of this album. I mean, it's being pushed like crazy. And rightfully so. It's a good album. It has a ton of crossover appeal, I think. But this is going to tell an interesting story. On one hand, we have people buying physical releases, which makes sense of why something would be number one. But right. on this other hand, on the other hand, we have these huge albums that are going to be streamed like crazy, which one is going to win out? Does it mean anything if Under Oath has a number one album? Yeah, it does. Because bands like this don't do this that often. Do you have Spotify up? Um, I don't, but I can pull it up. I'd be curious to see what their monthly listeners are. Do it's you, it's do you right remember, under a million right now. I was going to say, do you remember what it was a couple of weeks ago before there was any of this going on because I remember like a 400,000 number. I don't know if I'm totally wrong about that. Could be somewhere around then. I, I I remembered when they dropped or when they announced the album or there was buzz about it to check it then. And it was, it was lower than I thought it would be. But what's your take while I'm pulling this up? What's your take on just um, people buying up physical copies of Under Oath? Does that surprise you? Well, for one, everything up? you're telling me kind of surprises me a little bit because I didn't have an understanding of what... They're sitting at right under 900,000, which is, I would like them to be at around a million. What's Bring Me in the Horizon at now? Oh, God. And obviously, they haven't had an album in three years. Yeah, they're at 2.6 million. They're at 2. I'm yeah. just curious. But... um. All of this is new information to me. I didn't okay. realize that these packages existed. I didn't realize yeah. they were being so successful. I didn't realize you were talking about number one billboard period. So yeah. all of that makes me so happy. Absolutely. Honestly, yeah. because as you were talking, I was thinking about how there are times when you and I in waves push something. We really pushed yes. uh, the Facebook group to listen to Plot in You. We really pushed Under Oath and... I don't know if our Facebook group is the best audience for it because a lot of them don't respond to this kind of music, but we we try to we try to tell them, hey, this is different than yeah. We put our stamp in a on mirror, things. Yeah. things like that. Um, I didn't know that this was going to go as far as you've described. Yeah. So that's really getting exciting a ton of radio to me. play now. That's it's... that's really ex exciting to me, mm -hmm. and I'm glad because you're right. I I've been so much on the outside of that aspect of it. I didn't feel the polarity of it either, so it was nice to hear you say that there you haven't really seen a whole lot of that. Yeah. I did see comments like "Bring me the sleep wave" and yeah. all that kind of stuff, and some people just flat out hate it. Um, and then you have some fans that were like, "This isn't the under oath that I want, but I I support anything they do, so I'm on board." Which is like, okay, that's cool. Wouldn't it be great if we could get that for like Star Wars, like right? I don't know. It it is it, it is a big deal. It, it's a big well, deal. Well, the reason why I'm excited is because does this not hint at the possibility of them sticking around? A oh, bit? there's no doubt. So about if that. Under Oath sticks around a little bit, who else is gonna come up and sort of yeah. I I I'm excited to see where the genre is gonna go now. Because right now it feels like it feels like, I don't want to jump ahead of myself, but it feels like someone has resuscitated and sort of given CPR uh, to to this thing that we love. Well, I mean, I'll cast, cast our minds back <laughs> to earlier this year when I may, uh, had to put out a statement on my music show, and I think I did it on Weekly too, that I said that I was selling my stock on a lot of music genres and going all in on rock music. Cause I felt like something was happening this year. I felt it. I, I the heat meter's low, but I, I feel it. So I'm selling my stock, but it's funny because even before the plot knew there was some discussion that was like, 
what if every other song yeah isn't doesn't Absolutely. compare to feel nothing and there's some concern going into under oath yes. and and luckily i never i never really felt that vibe but of course there's always the possibility of what if this is just an embarrassment well every every album that has this great promise you know a lot of what i'm talking about investing in this genre more it does hinge on some of these big bands and what they do right for instance uh even though they're not a heavy band a band like brand new when they hit that number one spot i i did a whole episode talking about what does this mean for rock music it meant everything because if people if the heat meter is low on rock music as a whole and a band like brand new who doesn't have any relevance in the zeitgeist conversation because they just they don't do anything if it can still hit number one that makes people say well shit maybe listen with i'm just gonna say this rap and hip-hop music as popular as it is the bubble it it can't get bigger it can only burst from here and when i say burst i don't mean in like a negative way and all this stuff i'm talking about just for popularity sake when something gets so oversaturated people are going to get disinterested in it the industry has to be looking somewhere else right now just the natural cycle of things it seems like rock music and a br brand new piss it away with the shit that jesse lacy did right i mean all that shit yeah nobody fucking cares so under oath even if they don't hit number one if even if they can get somewhere in the top five which should be a no-brainer it's still huge. And I think people will look at this and say, there's something here. The next one that scares me is um, Architects, simply because there's no promise that they could go in a direction that Doomsday went in. If it did, that's great. Not as accessible as Under Oath was. Maybe they do go. Maybe they do. I don't know. But there's no promise of that specifically. There's no guarantee that could be a one-off. We, I have no idea. Where, where are they? So they just wrapped up, in my opinion, this is pure speculation, they just wrapped up a tour, a huge tour with um, Counterparts and um, a few other bands, and I think that tour was partially to be the last tour before they go record, help fund record a recording of an album and this right. and that. Um, anyways, uh, it it's a huge deal. The other thing I just want to say about this, and then we'll sort of put a pin in it. We'll move on. Um, Under Oath, one of the reasons they are so successful is because they do so much extra stuff to support themselves. And they've always done this, right? This documentary that we're talking about, they have always done these. Oh, yeah. All the way back to their, their Only Chasing Safety uh, Deluxe I, I've Edition. I've said it on here, and I would love, I would love for our listeners... <laughs> Who, who may not be interested in their music at all? I would love for our listeners to watch these documentaries because yeah. I think they're fantastic. I've spoke; they've they've all been good. Even their live uh, the, DVD. This newest good. one is a masterpiece. The what it shot so you already you already saw it. I've already seen it. I've already watched it. Do we have it? I have it. I can provide it to you. Uh, I'm going to be doing a review on it soon, and I want to do a commentary, and I think we we can do a commentary together for it. I'll talk about that in just a second, but not only the documentary, but like their social media presence, they're posting like these this week, they're posting these daily videos, like one minute long videos just called release week of them walking around doing press and stuff. Yeah. That alone is already so much more than so many of these bands. Do. Yeah. And that's so big, man. And um, they were doing these little studio videos before the album was released. And it's just all part of it. Um, this documentary was fascinating to watch really very fascinating i'm so excited it's it's fascinating because it makes it, it'll get your creative juices flowing of course it'll make you want to go write songs with uh your friends in nashville <laughs> and um it's uh it's just a lot of fun and it's especially a lot of fun to hear them work on this album one of my favorite things watching it was thinking about this whole thing of them being more accessible and maybe appealing to a new audience. And of course it's easy to say, well, Oh, they're just trying to cash in and do all this stuff. After you watch this documentary, you just realize that that's just not because you see how much that's work the, they put into it. 
it, not even that, just their attitude of it. They're just they just they're just writing music that, that they think sounds cool. Right. right. Yeah. And that's just not at all what they're thinking about. And the way it all came together, the fact that some p- members of the band have this mindset of writing pop music and writing, you know, more um, straightforward and linear songs where a whole other section of the band only wants to create chaos. And back in the day, they would say things like, this doesn't fit our brand. This doesn't do this. And now, instead of throwing out ideas, they're they're literally just saying, let's just put all of it together. And right. that's how great music is made. Um, I love the album. You love the album. I do. Um, uh, yeah. Man, I'm excited to watch it. It's really good. I'll, uh, yeah. <laughs> I'll, um, I'll figure out a way to get it to. Last night, Eric texted me. Oh, yeah? Said, Did you uh, watch the documentary? He said... What does he think of the album? He said, it sounds like our last night. And my reply was, when? <laughs> <laughs> and he said, all of it. Um, no, he texted me last night and said, what movie should I watch tonight? You want to know what I said? Rapture. Write me music. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about Brave the Storm. <laughs> well, Snelling... I'm not in the mood right now. Right, yeah. I can't just come up with things. Um, other other music stuff that I'll throw out here real quick. Um, 30 Seconds to Mars. You check out the album. It's interesting because I think I've been out. I, they might have released like two albums that I wasn't aware of. No, just one. Just the one? They, okay. They've only released one album between This Is War and this one. So, obviously, I've heard Walk on Water. That's a cool yeah. song. Yeah, yeah, But there are other songs uh, in the first half of that album where I th- was like, they're introducing a lot of, like, electronic and hip hop kind of elements. Like, like way more. it's way more than just involving Kanye on Hurricane. It which, was like... Which is not... You know that song is not canon right yeah um, that song is included on many illegal downloads but it yeah. was never officially it was kind of it was just a lot of it to me just because i felt kind of removed from from them yeah it felt kind of weird to me okay. so i need i need some time to adjust but i'm a big fan of yeah 30 seconds to mars in general i love their first two albums i think jared leto is a freak there's a lot of weird things going on with him personally. He's but, definitely uh, a freak because he looks like he's my age and he's fifty, almost fifty years old. Ridiculous. Fifty. Yeah, he's like forty-eight years old. I don't think he's that old. Look, I, I know he's older, but I'll look, look it, it up. up. I'll look it up. Um, he's closer to fifty than he is to forty. That's for sure. Um, my whole take with this album, it's forty-six. Wow. My whole take with this album was that um, there's so much about it that on the surface that I could just completely do without, which this is closer to that fallout boy album that came out. This is closer to the chain smokers. This is closer to the uh, one, uh, one more light from Lincoln park in the sense where it's these very electronic yeah. EDM heavy sort of pop rock songs. Yeah. However, 30 Seconds to Mars are just fantastic songwriters. They really are. Like, incredible. And here is my take that I gave. I haven't spent more time with it than the initial listens that I did for the music show. But my take on it was I had a lot of fun listening to the songs. The songs were really catchy. It was just banger after banger after banger after banger. Yeah. However, the problem that I have with that, sort of what I mentioned in our Under Oath review, is like, after a while, I kind of became overwhelmed with it. Like, it was seriously, and not just with the energy level, not that the songs were hard hitting, but it was like foot to the floor, just constant barrage beating me over the head with just these really over the top banger tracks that I was just like, my mind can't handle like all these, you know, you know what I'm saying? Like, I need it to kind of come down a little bit. I don't want to get my music on first listen every time. Like I need sometimes to be like, I don't really get this. I need to. Right. It was, it was just so much for me to process. It's funny. Cause that's how I feel. Yeah. I, I, I need to spend more time with it. I got through about ha- two thirds of it. And I was just like, I gotta turn this off. Like, I gotta, <laughs> I need to put this on the back burner for a little while and go like 
listen to some instrumental music or something. I think The Kill yeah. might be my top in my top five favorite songs of all time. It's a good song. It's just, you know what song I think is better than that on that album? Um I think my f- I think my two favorite 30 Seconds to Mars songs are The Kill and From Yesterday. From Yesterday is an incredible song. It's amazing. Yeah. You know what's annoying? The video for that song. Because it keeps stopping. Right. Because it's... A, just it's, play the, just it's play like the a, song. It's a short film. and Yeah. If um, I wanted a short film, I would have watched a short film. Well, they filmed it at that place. They made it worth their while because they filmed it at that place that's never been touched or filmed at or whatever the fuck. It was like it was like an you don't know that that was a, you're thinking of a different video i am not the from yesterday videos where they're fighting with yeah. swords right and that temple is yeah. a sacred place oh really and no one's been allowed to yeah. go go into it and they got special per- permission to film that video there. you know what i think is lame about jared leto do you know this you know this thing that he did uh on the um one of the anniversaries of kurt cobain's death I know that he sent used condoms to okay. Viola Davis on the set of Suicide Squad. So, which the Joker doesn't do shit like that. How do you know he's a fictional character? The Joker doesn't sh- do shit like that. Would you have rather That's so fucked. attempted to kill her? Yes. <laughs> really? <laughs> That's more in character. Okay. So, on one of the Didn't it be in jail? On one of the uh anniversaries of Kurt Cobain's death, he decided to upload a, a video of him covering a Nirvana song, which is nice, right? Sure. He actually covered two songs. Okay. The difference here <laughs> is that he uploaded a video of himself covering these two Nirvana songs dressed as Kurt Cobain and portraying him as a uh, character and uh, offered it as paying tribute, in my opinion, it's one of the most egotistical, like, self-serving things uh, that somebody could have ever done. <laughs> like, that's like me saying, I mean, it's it's different, but it's like me saying, you know what, to honor Martin Luther King, <laughs> Uh, I'm gonna dress in blackface and do a f- his fucking I have a dream speech. No, just play the song dressed as you. Uh, you fucking douche! Like that's so douchey. Well, I just thought it would be honoring. No, he also has uh, weird Hollywood parties and hooks up with underage girls. Do we do we know that or is that speculated? Speculated in the way that people speculate about Brian Singer, and it's not known fact. Really. You know what's weird about... He's a fucked up guy. You know what's weird about... Uh, well, he's obviously drinking the blood of young children to stay that young. Hell um, yes. You know what's weird about uh, 30 Seconds to Mars is the fact that they make really, really, really like poppy accessible music to just get as big as possible, but they don't need to do that. Like, they're just making it because they want to make it. You know right. what I'm saying? Yeah. Unless, like, they have band members that just, they're like, well, we kind of need to pay our bills, so let's make. And Jared Leto's like, well, okay, I'll, I'll make you some great songs. I don't know. The drummer is his brother. Is it the drummer or bassist? It's the drummer. What's oh, his? so I just committed. I just did what Jay Williams does all the What's time. His, you know his name's Shannon? Yeah. Uh, Shannon Leto. He also, speaking of documentaries, he has a great documentary about the music industry and and how shitty it is like oh really yeah it's uh pretty much documents all of um all of uh this is war like making this is war right and they get in like a weird uh record label i, I remember some of that yeah, yeah it's as a, it was happening it's weird because the documentary is not that old but that album came out a really long time ago well not a really but a pretty long time ago like over a decade no yeah. This is War is not 10 years old. Without a doubt, it's probably 12 years old. This I is War is out their out third album, right? This is War is the one with the tiger on it. Yes, I think it came out in 2006 or 7, maybe? I'm looking at it. 2007. Up. I'm calling it right now. Give it to me. Give it to me. Uh, let me get there. Hold on. I'm like the Scott Mance of album releases. <laughs> like, <laughs> it 2009. Out. Okay. 
So nine years old. Well, I mean, you still, I, I will accept I was proven wrong. That's still more than I thought. Yeah. You're getting older, Ryan. So. Kings and Queens. Good song. It's a good album. Closer to the Edge. This is War. Can I just say this about that album? None of those songs are as good as the some of the singles off of uh, the previous album. A Beautiful Lie? Yeah. Attack, another good song. A Beautiful Lie is a good song. The Man. Kill. The Kill. They're one of those bands. From yesterday. They're one of those bands that people forget that they have a, an album. Like, they actually, they forget that they have two albums because the album that came out in between the one that came out now and This Is War, no, yeah. I feel like nobody talked about yeah. that album. Love, Lust, Faith, and Dreams. Yeah, that yeah. was... I feel like it was more recent than five years ago. Man, they just take their sweet-ass time. Four years between This Is War and Love, Lust, Faith, and Dreams, and then five years between that and America. Well, they don't need, they, blah, 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 blah. they don't need to be a super active band. You know, they were just... I, know. I I offered you the opportunity to go see them live last year with me, with the 1975 and... Don't recall. And uh, Muse? What what show am I supposed to be keeping track of? Under Oath? Are we oh, yeah, I already that? bought my tickets to that. We're trying to work out an interview with the band. and But I'm, wouldn't we go to that show anyway? Yeah, we're going to it anyway. So here's what I'm doing. Um, if we do get granted that and we get on the, the guest list for it, I'm probably – one of them is going to go to my girlfriend. And the other one is probably – I don't know. We'll figure something out. Maybe do like a some sort of a local giveaway to anybody that can actually get here for that. I don't know. Tickets are expensive, like 40 bucks. It'll be the last time we ever get to see them in a venue. That's small. Probably. Um, what else do we have to talk about? Uh, you watch Trust. Yeah. So, uh, what a weird show because movie just came out. So, yeah, I didn't even know if you knew that because yeah. I didn't know that either. So, my, for those of you who don't know, Trust is a FX series on right now. Uh, the Watch Guy is very high on the show right there's now. There's two episodes out right now. And that's the only context I had. What it was, it, it was that it, words. Fuck. It's like the, the context that I had was that Brendan Fraser was back. I saw the mummies him. Brendan Fraser. Uh, huh? The mummies Brendan Fraser. Fraser. It's not Fraser. I don't care. I'm going to say it however I want. You don't get to do that with me. Actually, I can. You can, but it's still improper. So what? I'll do it anyways, just to annoy people. Brendan Fraser. All I knew was that he was wearing a cowboy hat and he was back on TV. I didn't realize that um I didn't realize the story. I didn't realize the rest of the cast. Well, it's kind of hard to know the rest of the cast when all you have left is uh Sutherland, which he, he's a Isn't fossil. Is Hillary Swank in this? I haven't seen her yet. Oh, okay. He's a he looks terrible. Donald Sutherland? Yeah. He's about to croak. He's a fossil. I mean, he just did the Hunger Games. I don't remember him. He aged 10 years. Anyway. Some people do that. Age. Not Jared Leto. Not Jared Leto. He's drinking the blood of frogs. So, for those of you who don't know, there's two episodes out right now. We're two episodes into Trust. And I didn't realize until I was watching the premiere, the pilot, that it's the same story that was covered in All the Money in the World. The movie that came out last year with Mark Wahlberg, John directed Paul by Paul Getty. Is that the guy's name? Paul Getty. Paul yeah, Getty. Paul Getty. John Paul. <laughs> John Paul Getty. And um, yeah, I didn't realize that. Yeah. And so I'm watching the premiere directed by Danny Boyle. I was like, what? whole season's directed by Danny Boyle. Why didn't I know this? Yeah. It was just, it was so weird to me that this flew under the radar. It was, fan of Danny Boyle stuff? I am. Yeah, I am. Some of your favorites. I, I love 28 Days Later. Yeah, I do too. I love it. Yeah, Slum Dog Millionaire. Slum Dog Millionaire is good. Yes. Train Spotting. Haven't seen Train Spotting. I think Train Spotting is massively overrated. Overrated? Overrated. It's a good movie. Um, I like overrated. one. I like one twenty seven hours. Yeah, one hundred twenty seven yeah, really hours. That was it. good. So, uh, anyway, and I'm excited to see him direct to James Bond, even though I would yeah. prefer Nolan do that. But, um, but no, uh, I am a fan of Danny Boyle. I'm glad Nolan's not doing Bond. Why? Because it means we get an, another Nolan movie. <laughs> uh, something that I actually care about. I don't care about James Bond. But James, but a Nolan James Bond is what would get me to see a James Bond movie. I mean, I, I feel like 
in the way that J.J. Abrams thought his entire life about his Star Wars movie. Yeah. I, I don't know if we got it, but that's that's what we would get if Christopher Nolan did that. But anyway, yeah, for sure. Um, I knew next to nothing about this show. So I'm watching the premiere and sort of baffled by all the stuff that was happening <laughs> without me knowing it. It was sort of uh, uh, humbling in that way. But uh, I thought it was... Uh, did you get to watch it? No, because um, if I ha- if I watched it, I would have to buy it on iTunes. That's right. And I've I'm kind of I can't buy too many things right now. I just bought Legion, I bought yes, Atlanta. Because you buy like a, the season pass that way, right? The episode just comes right to you every day. Uh, I get that, but um, it was good. It was a quality show. They were talking on the watch. They were talking about the second episode, and I'm really excited to see that because Brendan Fraser has like two lines in the premiere, but apparently yeah. the second episode is all about him. Um, but yeah, it's a, uh, it's a really interesting show and I'm excited to get to it. So the, it, it's baffling to me that this is based on a true story because, uh, the, I didn't know any of this, like even yeah. the real life story, like even when all the money in the world was coming out, I didn't know anything about this family because do you, do you know about them? Yeah. The Getty, the oil tycoons? Yes. I had no idea that <laughs> any of this was going on. Did in, you know that? Yeah. In American history. So it was sort of like a history lesson in that way. And I know that th- they had a disclaimer that was like, obviously, this is based on true right. events. Some actual lines of dialogue and things are like real and legitimate. But they, of course, say that it's organized for dramatic effect, effect in the way that like a Versace would. Right. Um, but it felt like it was authentic, and they didn't take as many liberties as they could have. So uh, it's it, it was just fascinating to watch because it was a history lesson, uh, if anything. But, um, but yeah, it's at an age where uh, obviously this guy's a, a strict conservative, right. and his grandson is like a super hippie that's into drugs, and he's against that culture, so... Um, the the end of the premiere ends with the kid getting kid, kidnapped, which right. is sort of where the movie begins because uh, it's the hunt for it's the in kid. Italy, is that right? Do what? It's in Italy. Uh, Ro- Rome, Italy. Right. Yes, is what, yeah. So, um, it's it's well shot, well made. It, it it's weirdly acted in a good way. Donald Sutherland is just playing a guy that I can't believe was real. Yeah. Uh, he has a lot of interesting habits. Uh, he has a woman that he's faithful to, but he also, uh, has other ladies that live there. So he has like five girlfriends. And so, uh, he uses one per night. And, uh, so all of that, it's weird to see that it was real as opposed to something that's just made for a movie, if you will. But, uh, Apparently, the second episode is super good. It's like a mini movie with Brendan Fraser, the lead, and that's how The Watch was describing it. So right. I, I, I'm I really excited You're about watching the rest of the show. I'm yeah. totally on board. I'm more on board with this than I was with Versace, apparently, yeah. because I only got through the first episode. Right. Um, yeah, I still haven't finished it like yeah. halfway through. I, I'm really into it. Yeah, I'm interested in hearing more about it from you. Um, probably won't be able to check it out till much later. Hopefully, hopefully it goes good. Hopefully... I hear good things and I can check it out later before obviously the it, end of the year. It was just weird that we were just talking about like, I think there's a lot of TV going on, but I think we both agree that not all of it is like, not all of it's pressing all of us. Not all of it has reached its way to the top. Either. Right. Like, yeah. So it was so weird that I feel like this is a top level show, but it just totally snuck up on me. Yeah. So I'd be curious to know uh, how much of our, uh, group is watching For the sure. show and what the, what their reactions are. And just to sort of uh, tie into that too, one of the reasons we're not really talking about Legion this week is because we obviously have our recap show. But if you have not watched Legion, a lot of people slacking. It just kind of. First of all, let me ju- let me just say this. Uh, so a lot of people slacking. I- I'll admit going into it, like I don't know, uh, it-, it might just be the temperature of television so far this year, but. My heat meter, I was excited, obviously, because we were going to do the show, but my heat meter wasn't red lava hot. After watching this episode, not only was I so locked in, this already, just off of the first episode, is a a show, a season of TV that you can't miss. It's unlike anything. (laughs) There's nothing on television like it. And it's so unique. 
It's such a special show. I'm not just saying it because we do. Listen, th- we've done recap podcasts about things that I wasn't super on board with throughout the entire thing, but I am 100% locked into this show. What recap podcasts have you not been completely locked in? Um, Le- I mean, uh, Leftover Season 3, I was pretty critical of. Um, uh, Game of Thrones, I was on, completely on board for. There were par- portions of... Um, Portions of counterpart that I was the, the only thing of. I can think of where you were like hesitant of even doing a recap show was when we did Animal Kingdom on Film Beef. No, no, no. <laughs> I'm not saying like I've we've done recap shows and I've hated the season. I mean that could be a possibility. I thought you meant you resented the recap show. No, no, no. I, I, I mean like if if there was something critical about it to say, I would say it even if we're yeah. doing a recap show about it. Um, last thing I have, and then we'll. You can close with whatever you want to close with. Uh, I got to bring up this Drake thing. Uh, randomly announced that he was going to be dropping um, a single on Friday, and he dropped it, and it's out, and it's fine. It's not. I don't think it's going to blow up the world, uh, which I'm glad for. I'm glad he didn't just put out. I'm glad he didn't just put out like another like sort of pop song because we had God's plan, which sort of took the world by storm with his. He's on his music video kick right now, trying to make these big statements with music videos. Right. Which makes sense. Um, he's been doing it for a while, but I needed more of a banger song from him, not just a pop hit. And this sort of set in the pocket between like a pop song and a banger for me. You know, he wasn't going in hard, which is good because, you know, it needs to resonate. A lot of cameos in it. I mean, Rashida Jones, um, Olivia Wilde obviously starts off the video. Um just a ton of other people on the video as well. But uh, this also comes with confirmation that he is, he does have an album coming out soon. No date, obviously just confirming that he's wrapping it up right now. It will probably be out before the summer um, because Drake like typically likes to own the summer. He likes having an album that will be played out through the entirety of, of the summer to sort of celebrate and whatnot. Um, I said it on the music show. I am in, I'm going to be supportive of whatever Drake album comes out. I'm going to get excited for it and this and that, but it's hard for me at this point in his career for me to just go crazy for anything because he plays everything so safe and he's never really challenging himself on an artistic level. Drake needs to make his weird like crazy album that makes me question what his music even is like life of Pablo or Uh, going all the way back to 808s and heartbreak. Either would do. I mean, (laughs) either would do at this point. Like, yeah, he's been toying with some different stylistic approaches, like doing the pop thing, doing the slow jam thing, doing the straight rap thing, but it's all still so very, very safe. And I just feel like he needs to do something. His star is as, bright as it's ever been there's right. no doubt about that but i think his legacy could really do with him pushing his own boundaries he's got his own day at the toronto raptors that's right uh reviews are in for his uh restaurant by the way in toronto i didn't know he had a restaurant he does what kind of restaurant um apparently it's a cross between a nightclub a sports bar and like some sort of asian fusion restaurant the reviews are fucking awful <laughs> The reviews for this restaurant are terrible. Oh, people because saying, of the food or because of the service they're saying ev- or everything. aesthetic, everything. They're saying like the food that comes out doesn't even make sense. Like, oh god, they're saying that like he has some private bathroom in there that people can go into, but there was like this huge long line, and literally they went in and it was as basic as basic could be. Like, it's stupid. It's just a a ploy. Um, people are rude. Like, if you don't spend at least like a thousand dollars on a bottle of champagne. People are going to treat you like absolute dick. And yeah, that sucks. You need to step up. Come on, man. Um, Get your head out of your ass, Drizzy. I wanted to ask you when you know that there's a TV show or a movie coming out and they're telling the same story, are you always going to go to the TV show about it? Um, Not necessarily. I mean, it depends, right? There's so many factors in that. Like, would you, exactly, would you rather, knowing what you know about the actual story of the Gettys, are you attracted to the movie version of it or are you attracted to the TV show of it? 
honestly, I am way more interested in the television show specifically because I obviously on the surface, it's we know we can tell a more intricate story with TV. However, I feel like the TV show has more names attached to it. Like Danny Boyle alone is doing television is intriguing. Uh, No, I mean, Ridley Scott. I'm, directed- say, I'm saying for me. I'm not saying in general. I'm not saying that's what people should renown. As- well, you said more names attached to it. In the premiere, the only two actors that I know are Donald Sutherland right. and Brendan Fraser. I'm saying for and me. Brendan Fraser in- is in two seconds. For me, for Jay Williams, it has more names attached to it that I can associate myself with. Brendan Fraser. Fraser. Uh, What's his name? The Sutherland guy? I just don't get how that could be. Well, that's fine. That's in your opinion. I'm saying for me. No, it's not about an opinion. I'm talking about the fact that Brendan Fraser has done nothing in forever. Right. Both of you and I are both indifferent on Donald Donald Sutherland. It comes down to Danny Boyle. Right. And there's like five people. So, but but here's here's what I take issue with. I'm saying, in my opinion, that's what I'm going for. And you said no as if it was a categorical, like... I'm right I'm, or wrong. I'm not. Thing. Con- I'm not like, challenging be- what you're interested in. I thought it was weird wording that you were like, "I gravitate more to these names." When all you have three names total versus like eight, and only one but, of those. But three- wouldn't a better response be, "Oh, that's interesting that that's what you think about it," as opposed to just, "No, that's incorrect." Like, well, well, help me out then. I'm confused. Why, when you have the amount of names is totally different, and the heat on all of them are. I mean, it's. I, I, well, that's what I was just explaining. I just said that the, the television show is obviously going to tell a more intricate story. I get that. Yeah. I can spend more time with it there. I'm a bigger fan of I don't even know who fucking directed the other movie. Ridley Scott. Okay. I don't, you know how I feel about Ridley Scott. I don't care about Ridley Scott stuff. I don't have a good track record with enjoying a lot of his things. I like Danny Boyle's work. I find Danny Boyle's work much more interesting and fascinating. The fact that Brendan. Frazier is actually even in the show. It's like, <laughs> like let's go see, let's go see this freak show going on. He's a cowboy. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I've heard it praised by the watch. The only thing yeah. I know about this other movie is that it had some Oscar buzz to it, which could mean nothing to me. And uh, they they <laughs> recasted the 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 pedophile. Whatever Kevin his Spacey. name is. Yeah. Yeah. What do you lean towards? Which one do you? I mean, I, I know I think the answer, but I think what's my answer? Well, it's a TV show because you haven't watched the movie yet, have you? Yeah, but my question was generic. I mean, yes, the example is my my original question was if there's a if there's a story and you know that there's a movie version and a TV show version of it, which are which one are you mm. going to gravitate to? So you might have a different answer, right? To that general question. What what do you think you're going to lean more so to, and then apply it to the Getty, and what's that answer? There's so few examples that even exist where one doesn't exist so much further than the other. Does that make sense? What's like, the world? <laughs> yeah, but uh, Watchmen. We're getting Watchmen, right? Yeah. It's hard for me to get excited about Watchmen because, like, it's cool. There's so many things that working for it, obviously, like that I should be excited about, but I actually. I didn't love the Watchmen movie, but I don't know how it could be. It was ahead of its time. I don't know how it could be, ex- especially visually, I don't know how it could be executed any better. Like, yeah. And going to HBO, yes, we can say throw out Game of Thrones all day, but I don't know if HBO can really match that. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I don't know if they're going to purposefully make it look like Snyder in a way, or if they're going to... I would hope not. I would hope it would... He's not producing. I think if he was producing, it would look like Zack Snyder yeah. still. It reminds me, it's kind of... How can you make Rorschach be any better? You know what a great example of this is? From Dusk Till Dawn. Okay. I didn't watch this show. Because the first season by design is literally the movie. That exists, but yeah. you just spread the movie out. So you're adding... Animal Kingdom. <laughs> Animal Kingdom is another example of that. Yeah. yeah. I think in that particular case, Animal Kingdom kicks the shit out of that TV show. Where did it... Where has but it worked? Like, where... I, I mean, I think From Dust Till Dawn works in the sense that I am a massive fan of that movie, and I enjoyed the TV show. When you compare the TV show of From Dust Till Dawn... To other television, I don't think it reaches the level that we want it to. Yeah. But it, it was 
just cool and entertaining to watch still, even though it was fun for me to watch, even though I knew like, wow, they're really just doing the movie over 10 episodes. Yeah. But it was still enjoyable because there are things that are added in and it's still a cool story to me. So that was, that was such a weird, I prefer the movie in that instance, but it was still fun for me to experience that as the TV show. So it wasn't really an either or in that way. In you know, that sense. You know what I don't care at all about? Like I'm, I'll, I will only watch what I'm about to say specifically for this show. The Lord of the Rings Amazon show. I don't care at, at all about it. Really? I am. I'm just, I like, I think Lord of the Rings is the trilogy of films. Good. Cool. Really cool. I'm not a fan of it though. Like I'm not like a right, I've, right now. I'm more of a fan of what it means. Okay. For the landscape. Yeah. I'm interested to see what the the response to that would even be. I I just I don't for how big Amazon is, I just don't think they're as in the conversation as they should be. Does that make sense? What like I feel like they're still an outlier. It's like when people tell me to go watch a show on Crackle or something. It's just like <laughs> okay. <laughs> I have something funny to say yeah, when we wrap up. Anyway, okay. to put, put put a cap on it right You're now. You're going to tell me to watch something on Crackle? No, no. no. Uh, to put a lid on this, um, point is, right now, right now as it sits, we have Atlanta. Now we have Trust and Legion. FX continues to kill it while yep. Game of Thrones is on Hunt the Air. Uh, I still want to watch Barry on HBO. I'm still intrigued by that idea. Um, so that's pretty cool. I haven't I haven't watched it yet, but Outlander. Uh, Kayla's gonna do an Outlander recap. I'm excited for I'm down for that. I'm excited for Lost in Space. I think that is next weekend, this coming weekend. So I'm excited to see that. I hear great things. So uh maybe so yeah. maybe Kayla can do a Outlander recap show with your friend that you've connected with. What's that person's name that did Lostpedia? You know who I'm talking about? You forgot her name, didn't you? It did Lostpedia. Yeah. She was going to come on for the counterpart recap one day when you set out. Didn't she do Lostpedia? I I legitimately don't know who you're talking about. You were going to set me up with this person when you were going to set out one week of out or of uh of counterpart. Who was it? On Twitter, like it was somebody that you had on for in the film beef day. Oh, Tara Bennett. Yeah. She did the Lost Encyclopedia. Lostpedia, is that even a thing? Is that a website? Like Wikipedia? I don't know. I mean, I figured... She, she wrote the Lost Encyclopedia. Yes, she, I'm sorry. Also, Tara, Tara Bennett. Yes. She also did an Outlander companion thing. As yes, well. she did. She's yeah. done quite a few of those. Maybe she can do a podcast with Caleb. Um, They're busy. I, They're, she, I don't know if she's... Back. I don't know if she's... She's still a writer. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't know if she has the time to do a full podcast. But uh, all it takes is thirty minutes. Tara is uh pretty charismatic and Kayla will just be like, Yeah, yeah. Oh, when she talks about Outlander. You know she's re- <laughs> she's rewatched the show I think three times in the span of like two months. What a freak. I love it. And Why not only that, not only that, she bought the entire series on books and she's reading all of them or listening to them on audiobook right now. What a psychopath. She I, will even tell you, like, I don't know where this fandom for this came from. God, I would love for her. Why Why hasn't she done something? I mean, Does she not want to? Well, she's just busy. Right, I get it. God, what a... She runs a business. What a freak. <laughs> but I love it. She, yeah, it's crazy. I w- Yeah, that's cool. I wish she would have done that. But anyway, she doesn't have to, but it's all good. All right, let's wrap up. Uh, Yeah, so guys... <laughs> I was going into walking there. So guys... Follow me on Twitter. <laughs> Follow me on Twitter. The only characteristics you just did were a physical thing with your hands and people just think you just whispered. Just now. Come on. These guys, they got a podcast. Uh, Why does he me. have to whisper? I don't. He he goes into oh, that. Yeah, he does, doesn't he? Yeah. Guys. Come on. You know. They have a they have a podcast. And these guys, they're good. They're uh, you can follow me on Twitter. Catch me if you can. It's middle of the road Spielberg. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at WhatUpSnell. Sometimes you can catch me streaming 
video games very poorly on Twitch. Uh, the Twitch is not what up, Snell. It's a sight sound pod for Twitch. Um, links to all of that stuff are in the description below. And uh, we have a lot going on right now with Legion, and we're starting Afterthoughts on Collider. I'm going to try to get Jay to maybe uh, put a little kick in the t-shirt store, and we'll see what we can do because we haven't uh, made a lot of waves there. So we might try to get some new merch in uh, for the Collider crowd. And what was the other thing I was going to bring up? Oh, <laughs> Patreon's coming. <laughs> that's it we just have to make a video you know how happy it makes me to know that so the ball for patreon was in my court for a while then i threw it over to yours so you know what's not what's that you know what the problem is is that every you're spending too much time on twitch no when you could be doing no the every time we hang out it's to podcast that's and true. then we leave that we never have, we hardly ever have any additional time to do anything. You else. could just text me sometimes and just be like, "Hey, can you do this right now?" And I'll either say no or yes. I think you would always say no. Maybe you got to try. Jay, can I come over? Just no. You got to try. I get enough of you. Just try. If you th if you throw it out, I'll either bite or I won't. I don't, uh, I don't buy that for a second. Guys, I was guys. I was on a I was on a boat where a woman died. That happened. Did you know that? Christopher Walken was on the boat where that one dude pushed the woman off, allegedly. You don't know this story? <laughs> What's that guy's name? He was in uh he was in Austin Powers. Mike Myers. No. The he's like Seth a, Green. He's like another character. Oh Robert uh, what's his name? Wagner? Robert Wagner, yeah. Christopher Walken was on the boat that day. Just kind of your voice, <laughs> but I'm <laughs> like you have those cadences. I'm doing, sometimes. I'm doing a thing. You can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Jay Williams. Jay, that is Y to the E. The same for both. Be on the lookout for mu more than music later this month. Hopefully, that would be great. Um, we love you all. Thank you guys so much for stopping by for a long episode, longer episode. Last week's weekly. episode was this long. All right, cool. Hope you guys have a great week. Enjoy yourself.